Bluebill Day. I know where three lakes of North Wisconsin blue challenge the monotonous march of jack pine and scrub oak over the left-hand corner of the state. The lakes of which I speak are a triumvirate among thousands of similar bodies whose shores have been inhospitable to the settler and benevolent to the angler and the hunter. These lakes seem to have several names, but most of the people thereabout call them the Richards Lakes. Less than 200 yards separates one from the other. They stretch east and west. The one farthest east is the largest, nearly a mile long and half as wide. The one farthest west is not quite so large. The one in the center of the chain is the smallest but deepest. From its northern shore projects a stocky headland that narrows to a slim point, clad with trees to within 50 feet of the tip. And one dazzling warm October day, I shot ducks on this point. In the center of four trees, grouped in a perfect square, I sat on a shell box and enjoyed the easiest duck shooting I ever expect to encounter outside of a rich man's club. At noon of that memorable day, Joe dropped into the headquarters of the old Duck Hunters Association. Out of doors, the bright October sun flooded the flaming oaks and pines with the warmth of August. The lake on the shores of which headquarters are established seemed drinking in the unseasonal heat wave, as though to fortify itself against approaching winter. Only that morning we had hunted, with indifferent shooting, on a nearby slough. The president of the association was taking 40 winks to make up for the early beginning of the day. Let's get going to Richard's Lakes, cried Joe of the stentorian voice and boundless energy. Mm, not today, thanks, was the president's dictum. Weather's a bit too fine, isn't it, Joe? I asked, wiping my brow. I was warm, and the fever of Indian summer made me so lazy that I had not taken the trouble to doff heavy garments. Told you yesterday we were going to Richard's Lakes, said Joe. There's always good duck shooting over there. Got the boat on the trailer, decoys in the car, and we're all set. Mr. President, I interposed. It is apparent that the Honorable Joe took our promises of yesterday in good faith. If it is in order, I suggest that we accompany him to the fabled lakes and find out if all he says is true. Take your casting rod along and see if there are any bass over there. The president is a lover of variety. Duck hunting he adores and bass fishing he worships. Surfeited with the former, my appeal found its mark. Overruled, he moaned, and while he gloated over the joys of fishing in a new and comparatively unfished lake, I pondered on the useful purpose the rod might serve in the retrieving of a dead duck caught offshore in the weeds. Ten miles of journeying over a winding up and down sand trail brought us to the westernmost lake. It gleamed brightly through the trees, but there was not a duck in sight on its surface. On to the second we drove. The farthest one's usually the best, opined Joe. Mm, I'll take this one, I volunteered, if no one else wants it. The personnel of the association agreed. I was transported across the lake and given half the decoys. Then Joe and the president departed with the boat for the conquest of the farthest lake. My blind, I discovered, had been thoughtfully made for me some 15 years before when four spruce cones fell so as to form the corners of a tree square, six feet on all sides. I heard the jolting car and trailer disappear on the road to the other lake and sat on the shore for a moment's contemplation of autumn's glory. The decoys bobbed slightly in the wind, which was blowing directly off the point. The sun glanced ridiculously off their painted forms. They seemed utterly impotent to attract ducks. Indeed, there was not a duck in sight anywhere, on the lake or in the air. I made a pillow of my heavy blanket coat and lay on my back. 
staring upward at a peaceful blue sky that seemed never to have looked down upon the flight of ducks. On such a day, I speculated, ducks would likely be resting undisturbed in the hundreds of inaccessible potholes that cover the region. I was jolted from my daydreams by a tremendous sound, like thin silk being torn, that uh, billowing whisper which filled the air when ducks are flying en masse. It seemed incredible, but when I raised my head, I was staggered at what I saw. A thousand, maybe two thousand ducks were in the air. I knew they must have come from the lake to the east of me and had doubtless been frightened into flight at the approach of the other two hunters. They came up from behind the trees on the high ridge that separates the two lakes. Obviously, my lake was their chosen objective, and there was I, lying like a ninny behind the decoys, daydreaming, my sheathed double gun and shell box reposing in the tree blind fifty feet in back of me. I remained motionless as the main flight passed over in fairly close range. Then, not thirty yards from me, a flock of forty or fifty plowed into the water. There was nothing else for me to do but dig out for the blind. And as I did so, the visitors roared away to join the throng of ever-increasing friends that had swept to a landing at the upper end of the lake. With trembling fingers, I assembled the gun and fumbled in the shell box. Thunderation. There was only a part of a box of shells. Twenty-two, by actual count. I felt like walking down the shore and making a general announcement to the ducks that they might all go now because I was going home to soak my head in a water barrel. How many times had I toted that preposterous shell box in rain and shine, filled to the muzzle with no less than eight boxes of shells, only to find opportunity for one or two shots? Ducks were scooting across my point like dandelion bloom before the wind. At the far end of my lake, their brethren and sisters were parrotting and quacking in bluebill and mallard sociability. Later I learned that there was only one flock of mallards among the hundreds of black-hooded bluebills, and they tarried not long. I deliberately let flock after flock dust across the point while I thought out a plan of action. With 22 shells, it would take some powerful lucky shooting to bag the limit of 15 ducks. So I decided to take only the easy ones. The wind was in my favor. If they decoyed as the others had, there was one and only one opening in the blind from which to shoot. It was a perfect porthole frame with spruce boughs. A shot from any other angle without considerable rearranging of my blind or the building of an entirely new one was impossible and blind building was not in my thoughts. I would have to be careful, but maybe I could make my 22 shells do the trick. My principal fear in not doing proper honor to my membership in the old Duck Hunters Association lay in the tongue lashing the president would administer when he learned of my plight. He had often cautioned me to be ready for any emergency. <laughs> in fact, it was at his urging that I had often lugged pounds and pounds of shells to remote sloughs and duck passes without any immediate recompense. Off to my left, on the other lake, I heard the first boom of guns. My companions were all set in a blind somewhere, I conjectured, and would likely drive more ducks to me. Sure enough, a flock of butterballs topped the ridge between the two lakes and slanted straight for my decoys. It was a murderously easy shot and the two birds dropped stone dead. Two ducks and 20 shells left. I had to get 13 more with 20 shells. For me, that's impossible under normal conditions. There must be no silly shots at high or fast flying ducks, lest I wound one and then, liver heart that I am, I'd probably waste four or five shells putting it out of misery. No, I decided. I must take only the easy ones and take them permanently. The offshore wind quickly wafted my dead pair out into the lake. They would be picked up later on the opposite shore, exactly at the place where the returning lodge members, now at Lake Number 3, would park the car preparatory to coming after me in the boat. Suddenly, there were eight mallards high overhead coming straight across the point. 
Evidently, they had parted company with the sputtering bluebills. I had a shot I could not resist. I leaped from the blinding blind and shot from a miserable stance at the first of the octet. The third came down with a sensational somersaulting and was soon bobbing with the wind toward the opposite shore. I occupied the interim before the next flock came with mathematics. Uh, Nineteen shells left and three ducks dead. Not bad. If my arithmetic held out, I might make a score. My eye accidentally caught a movement on the water through the hindering spruce growth. I adjusted my vision to a new and larger opening and was astounded to find every one of my bluebills swimming eagerly toward me. The front rank leaders, not a hundred yards distant, they came right along. And I decided that such foolery had to stop. With my gun to my shoulder, I shouted at him, and the afternoon call broke up in wild confusion. I fired both barrels, even tried to reload for a second chance before looking around for the dead and wounded. Search as I would, I could find nary a feather on the water. The legion of ducks had come and gone, offering me the kind of a shot any greenhorn could have scored on. My shame was numbing. A handful of incomers flirted low over the decoys an instant later, and I was so flustered that I made two perfect misses. Now, ordinarily, duck hunters with any pride whatsoever would draw the well-known veil over such happenings. It's much easier to forget and ask forgiveness of oneself before one develops an inferiority complex and loses all confidence. Such experiences prove strongly the influence of mental attitude in duck shooting. One miss leads to another, and that is largely due to the inability of the hunter to readjust himself mentally to his usual form. Fifteen shells left and twelve ducks to go. Things looked bad. The bogey of wounded ducks was to be considered. I waste no time in dispatching him. I have even carried heavy shot in my shell box for their long range to reach the wounded ones that drop quite a ways out. Unless you've tried it, you have no idea of the number of shells that can be wasted in trying to stop a wounded duck. From the other lake I heard intermittent shooting and concluded that the bass had been forgotten. The shots were usually followed by a movement of ducks. We were driving the birds back and forth between us, although some of them darted westward over the hill and sought refuge in lake number one, where there was no one to disturb them. My three dead ducks were by this time out of sight in the wavelets on the other side of the lake. The next opportunity took the form of a squadron of bluebills coming dead on. The white markings on the heads of the females were plainly discernible when I fired. Two dropped with the first shot. They flared to the right, and the second shot, the only genuine one I made that day, caught the last duck far out. To make it, I once more scrambled out of the tree fortress and fired. It restored my confidence to see that duck take a hard, slanting fall to the water, completely dead. But one of the other pair was wobbling his head. I took no chances with him, but advanced to the water's edge and executed him instantly. Three ducks with three shots. I was keeping up fairly well. Nine ducks to go and twelve shells left. What wouldn't I have given for a case of shells? so that I might accept this shooting in true sporting fashion, taking them as they came. Most of my attention was occupied with watching through the natural porthole of the blind, so that I was taken completely by surprise when another flock of birds swam <laughs> into the decoys, this time from the left. I was about to raise them and try a shot when I caught another shadowy movement through the spruce. Not fifteen feet from me, close inshore, swam thirty or forty bluebills and ringnecks, headed for the decoys and swimming. I wondered if these ducks had suddenly gone crazy. Perhaps they'd eaten of some lotus-like weed from the depths of the Richards Lakes. Or, and this is more likely, they were newcomers in the country fresh from some wild haunt to the north, where the destroying hand of man was unknown. I let him swim away from me, 
toward the decoys and planned a campaign. My other shots on departing ducks, I figured, must have been failures because of undershooting. This time I struggled from the trees as quickly as the encumbering branches would permit and caught the rising ducks from a better position. To stop these ducks, one must swing and raise the gun simultaneously. On teal and mallards rising suddenly, it's mostly a vertical movement of the gun barrel, but the bluebills and many other varieties possess no power of leaping straight into the air. Their takeoff is more like that of an airplane. They have yet to master the trick of going straight or nearly straight up in the air. The first shot missed. The second found a fair mark, and the duck which I judged to be a ringneck dropped dead. Eight ducks to go and 10 shells left. The ducks were gaining on me. I must do some more merciless shooting through the porthole at incomers with outstretched wings ready to alight. The next chance materialized in that way, and two remained behind out of a flock of a dozen or more. Six ducks to go and eight shells left. All this time, ducks were coursing across my point in the blazing sun from every angle. A persistent bombardment echoed from the other lake. To have shot on this point from a blind of conventional build with an unlimited supply of shells, would have been nothing short of duck murder. There would have been many misses, but who cares? It uh, would have afforded an afternoon's lesson in point shooting from every angle that I have never had, and what's more, that I need badly. Another straight-out chance at incomers ready to light, netted three, all dead with only two shots. I waited for those three with malice aforethought, and they died suddenly and satisfactorily. That left three ducks still to be downed and six shells with which to do it. A pot shot offered itself when four foolishly swam in, but I passed it up. Not only is it a bit rough to take them in this manner, but they are, be assured, hard to kill on the water. Many a greedy hunter can testify to that. I let him swim off. When a small flock flew in shortly after to leave two of their number behind, the swimmers arose fussily fifty yards away and departed. Only one more duck to go now, and four loaded shells. I was doing famously. Surely I could afford to gamble with those four shells. I abandoned the tormenting blind and stood motionless on the end of the point. My presence did not seem to frighten the moving flocks. A large bunch from the other lake came over high, and two of the precious shells were gone to no purpose. This flock was followed by a single, coming high from the left. The first one missed, the second sent him plunging down, and my shooting was over. I sat on the point as motionless as I could and witnessed one of the most amazing duck shows I have ever heard of in this part of the country. There were hundreds in the air from time to time, and two large bunches swam into the decoys, oblivious of my presence in the open. They seemed to realize that all was not well, for they approached slowly and tarried but a short time before paddling away. When I retreated to the blind later and was completely hidden, several small bunches swam into the decoys, looked them over, and departed hastily. And then the car, with jolting trailer, creaked along the sand trail across the lake. It was growing dim by that time, and soon I made out Joe's lights through the trees. Laughter drifted across the water to me as they unloaded the boat. It sounded as though they were feeling sorry for me left to my own devices on that point. While they had chosen the other lake where the shooting was supposed to be better, the president came over for me in the boat. Gee, I'm sorry you weren't with us, he began. All the ducks in upper Wisconsin had a grand reunion right under our noses. Don't feel sorry for me, your honor, I replied. My 15 ducks are over against the shore. And if I were any kind of a sport, I would have killed them all with a slingshot. The Big Pothole 
Up in North Wisconsin, there's a big pothole lake where you can get some grand duck shooting, providing you can find the place. The president of the old Duck Hunters Association once described the route in to a non-member as follows. Um, turn right at the first schoolhouse as you enter Wisconsin. Uh, don't ask Joe. We pay him for not telling. Keep right ahead on the sand trail, bearing to the left and sort of up and down. Park your car by the old Ram Pike that was hit by lightning in 1922 and walk in from there over the trail. It's only three miles. So forbidding was that six-mile walk in and out that even the few who knew of this duck Valhalla hunted it but seldom. Your Winchester farmer of Wisconsin's barren lands might tramp that far for a buck, but any well-situated resident thereabouts could get ducks with less effort. Only wild followers of the old school, like Mr. President, make a practice of going into such remote places. However, we had evolved a go-light system, which eased the labor. In the first place, we took not more than eight or ten decoys in the big gunny sack and loaded our pockets with shells. Then with guns, thermos, lunch, and camera, we were fairly well geared for the long hike. Hikes out with a limit apiece of mallards only seemed to lighten our burdens. There was one objection to the limited number of decoys. A setup of eight boosters required superfine work with a duck call. And right there is where Tom comes into the story. His name wasn't Tom, but it'll do. Tom was the owner and guardian of the lower end of a fine, hard sand trail that would bring a car to within a quarter mile of his place. He not only owned the original quarter section, he had homesteaded years back, but had gobbled up other tracks nearby. For Tom, Tom was the exception that proves the rule that you cannot farm the scrub oak barrens of Wisconsin. Tom farmed them. His Holsteins were sleek and fat. His corn grew tall. His root house groaned with viands from season to season. In addition to his success with the sandy soil, Tom had added to his cash income by manufacturing in his barn a duck call. It was a lucrative business, even though the blamed duck call wasn't any good. It was further proof of the man's resourcefulness. In that country, they say you can farm the sand if you get three rains a week, but one of them's got to be fertilizer. An optimistic settler with $10,000 and a pronounced deafness asked a friend what the prospects were on that soil for the growing of nuts. He thought he had received a favorable answer, bought land, and went to work. In a few years, he was broke. Accosting his advisor, he complained, I thought you said I could grow nuts on that land. You got me wrong, neighbor. What I said was you'd go nuts. Now one more yarn before we return to Tom in the big pothole. It's about the lumberjack who retired to a farm in the sand. He was a poor farmer. The jack seldom made a success of farming after tasting the freedom of the camp, the drive, and the town. And after a few years on his acres, an old bunkhouse crony visited him. He noted a new settler nearby on land the Jack had originally owned. The crony inquired about the new neighbor. Well, sir, explained the Jack, the land um, was getting me down. I was looking for a buyer, and this fellow came along and offered me $50 for 25 acres, but I fooled him. When I handed him the deed, it was made out for 50 acres instead of 25. The president of the old duck hunters and I had walked into the big pothole enough times to prove ourselves with Tom. Um, you'd have thought he would relent and let us use his road, but he declined to make any exceptions. Mr. President, being on the resourceful side himself, tried various ways, that is to say, he tried everything but cold cash. In the preamble to the old duck hunters' constitution, there is a word about the Magna Carta, King John, that economic royalist, and the inalienable rights of a gentleman in good standing to shoot the duck any place where he trespassed only upon the duck. Eminently fair. Bribes were all right, the president ruled, but no filthy lucre must change hands. 
The bribes took the form of tailor-made cakes, cans of tobacco, and one or two bottles of the demon rum, of which at times Tom was inordinately fond, doubtless as solace for his stern struggle with the sand. These gifts were included in a five-year philanthropic program, at the end of which the association hadn't as much right to Tom's sacred road as the undersized chipmunks that ran up and down its ruts. Personal relations between Tom and the association could not have been better. And that was the galling part of it. Tom was an excellent neighbor. Glad to see you, boys. Come right in. Have a taste of Ma's new wine. Ain't seen hide nor hair of anyone but Ma in two weeks. And at such times, the president would tactfully point out Tom could see the association much more often if he'd open up that road, and that would send Tom into his shell. Anything but open the road. So, the association continued to chafe its heels in rubber boots over the three-mile trail. Um, his duck calls were long, black, hollow affairs almost big enough for a rabbit to hide in. Perhaps he has never sold more than a few hundred of them at a dollar apiece, but Tom is the kind of man who can make $200 go a long way. The president purchased his call from Tom in a weak moment when he thought Tom was going to let us drive in on his road. We'd been warned that the call wasn't any good at all, that in fact the only good one he ever made, he kept for himself. This wonderful instrument, the local legend held, had a reed fashioned out of draw-filled copper. Or was it hand-hammered platinum? I don't recall. But after you once heard Tom employ it on a flock of cautious mallards, you were ready to believe it was a personal presentation from the angel Gabriel. No more accomplished Paganini of the marshes ever shook tobacco crumbs out of a duck call. After a few blats from the commercial product, which Tom had put on the market, the president stowed it in his old brown Mackinac pocket and concluded the old buzzard found the perfect formula and deliberately threw it away. Came a morning late in the season when the old duck hunters toiled over the three-mile trail by the aid of flashlights. It was pitch dark. Halfway in, it began to snow, and the going became slippery. The president was cussing Tom. If he'd let us use that road, we could have slept another hour this morning. We scattered our eight decoys beyond the edge of the flaggers on the favorite West Point, fixed up the blind a bit and settled back. Shooting time came and passed and Tom had not arrived. Though the snow was thick, we would have heard him calling from any point on the pothole. His favorite blind, regardless of wind direction, was in what we called the South Bay, a mere indentation in the shore. We were congratulating ourselves on Tom's absence when from the South Bay came the unmistakable notes of Tom's tutor. He's just warming up to the day's work like a cornet player in a circus band, explained the president. That's not his best. That's only home sweet home with one hand. Wait until he hits his stride on Auld Lang Syne, two hands and triple tonguing. Through the snow, we glimpsed a dozen mallards beating down the middle of the pothole. The president gave him a strident highball, his own vocal conception of you who Hardly had he called and turned the mallards when Tom struck up his interpretation of a mallard come all ye on his duck call. The mallards wheeled all the way around, disappeared in the snow, headed for Tom's blind, and shortly we heard two snow-muffled booms in the South Bay. He's taken them right off our gun barrels, the president snorted. My call was a signal for him to begin. He didn't see those ducks through the snow. Man, that's grand larceny. The president's jaw projected outward a little. His brown eyes snapped. He laid the crooked little pipe carefully against a scrub oak bough and thrust a hand into the sagging pocket of the old brown Mackinac. Forth came three old leg tethers for live decoys, reminders of better days. One plug of Brown's mule chewing tobacco, slightly gnawed four 20-gauge shells at which he sniffed contemptuously, and finally an object shiny and pocket-worn, the fraudulent instrument Tom had sold him for a duck call. 
Maybe I can get the damn thing to work, he muttered. He peered through its barrel. He blew through it. Sand, tobacco crumbs, pocket lint, and jack pine needles issued therefrom, but no sound. The president probed the instrument with a long forefinger, but no matter how hard he blew, he could not produce sound. Finally, he stepped from the blind and swished the instrument in the water. Something loosened up inside, and the call did produce sound, like a loon with a can tied to its tail, said the president. But it seemed better than nothing at the moment. A pair of ducks were sighted. They saw our decoys swung toward them. The president began what was intended as feeding chatter. The two mallards climbed like they had been shot. Almost instantly, Tom, from his listening post, cut loose with his call. Again we waited. Again the two snow-muffled booms. Significant witnesses to Tom's prowess with his magic tutor. The president stood up and called upon his ancestors to witness that this was the foulest incivility ever visited upon an innocent man, the work of a fiend incarnate. His philippic was moving. He made as though to fling Tom Spurious' duck call into the pothole, but stayed his arm when it was halfway through the forward motion. The fire faded from his eyes, and he grinned. The situation, he declared, calls for the most sovereign of remedies, sweet oil and diplomacy. We've used up all our diplomacy, but we still got the sweet oil. He fumbled in the other pocket of the old brown Mackinac. This time he produced a flat brown bottle, which he uncorked and held to my nose. If that isn't sweet oil, what is it? I said it smelled like Applejack to me. I even mentioned that it had been my Applejack and thought it had been in my pocket. The president explained I was right. That's where it had been. It was originally confiscated out of sheer capitalistic greed, he explained. But now I propose to uh, uh, distribute it. Production for use is the term, I believe. Tom dearly loves Applejack. He left me. I watched him for a couple hundred yards before the snow swallowed him. It was obvious he proposed to inflict upon Tom the social amenity that the noble red man, late of these very acres, had found harder to cope with than cold and famine. Tom did like a dollop of rum, and today was the day for it. The president was absent an hour. From the East Bay, the boom of Tom's 12-gauge sounded less often. The president returned with the virtuous look of a householder who has gone outside in his nightshirt on a stormy night to nail back a banging shutter. Tom, he announced ungrammatically, is took care of good. Three mallards loomed out of the snow. The old duck hunters faded into the face of the blind. Suddenly from beside me, came the noblest duck calling I had heard since Tom had been silenced. I turned my head to witness the performance. The president explained during a four-bar rest that it wasn't Tom's. I was still laughing when I had waded back from the task of picking up two green heads. When I left Tom, said the president, he was rolled up like a cocoon in his long sheepskin coat, sound asleep. To caution what Applejack will do on an empty stomach... The president reenacted the scene in the South Bay blind. Tom had been his same old self. He'd been chilly when he heard a shell clink on glass in the president's pocket. My chilly day. You ain't carrying a drop, are you? Certainly, Tom. Drink up. Now, about the road. No, Tom couldn't go long on that. Say, that's mighty perky hard cider. Oh, well, thanks. Don't mind if I do. Um, if you ever change your mind about that road, Tom, come and see me. Don't forget, Tom. I'll be waiting. Sure. Sure thing. I guess I'll take a little nap. Didn't sleep good last night. It was then that the president of the old Duck Hunters Association had reached over and exchanged his spurious duck call for the real McCoy. The real McCoy, indeed. 
Looks more like my old horn than my old horn does itself, said the president, studying it. I'd take it apart and look at the reed, but he seems to have it set just so anyway. If I can't make them, I can play them. And he went to work with the stolen Stradivarius. When we saw ducks through the snow, he invariably turned them. When none were flying within our limited range of vision, the president practiced his repertoire, which is no limited portfolio. Just as good as Tom's, in fact. Give him an instrument, the like of which he had that day, and the result is pure art. An hour passed. Finally, from Tom's blind, following an especially loud highball by the president, came the sound of the president's late duck call. It was a ludicrous pipsqueak, thin and faked. It was followed by other attempts, each less like duck language than the previous. The old sinner, chortled the president. That'll teach him. I'd give four of those green heads we've got to be watching him right now. During a silent interval from the South Bay, the president surmised that Tom was taking it apart. Then he'll find out it isn't his own call. Oop, down, there's a pair. The old Duck Hunters Association was picking up its decoys when Tom showed up, as the president predicted he would. I was wrapping the cord around the mouth of the worn gunny sack after the pickup. Looking up, I saw Tom loom out of the snow, long sheepskin coat, ear-lapped hunting cap, high duck boots and all. His nap had served to restore him to a considerable extent. He was almost the same old Tom, cagey, courteous, sly, but a bit whiffy when you stood downwind from him. He gossiped about the weather, the coming election, the high price of groceries, and the outrageously low price of milk from the cow. We were on the point of leaving when he spoke up, more to the point. Uh, e you didn't see nothing of an old duck tutor, did you? Can't say I did, President replied. Funny, I lost mine somewhere. Certainly no one would steal it. Why, your tutor's hanging around your neck right now, the president pointed. No, it ain't mine, Tom said. Mine's different. Well, what do you mean, different? I got a tutor just like yours. You said you made one just as good as another. But difference doesn't make which one you've got. Tom colored. Well, that old tutor was different. He said lamely. You don't mean to say you make some tutors better than others? No, I mean, it taint that. Tom was floundering. But you know how a feller gets to feeling about his own tutor? Bosh! The president snorted. Duck call is a duck call. You stick the reed in a hollow wooden tube and there you are. The president shouldered his gun and stretched out his hand. We gotta run, Tom. If we're gonna get back to town before the roads are snowed under... Uh, yeah, I, uh, I was just thinking, Tom said. You could see he was, too. The president of the old duck hunters had the pressure on him. Uh, I was just thinking that maybe next year um, I'd ought to let you fellas in by the road. It'd save work for you. Splendid, shouted the president. Thank you so much. Now we must run. So long, Tom. See you next fall. The president turned again, but Tom stopped him. Tom had never met a duck hunter as sharp as this before. His plight was growing desperate. He'd given away his rights to the road and still hadn't got his duck call back. Before you go, said Tom, you might look around and see if that old tutor of mine is about. I've been shooting here during the week. Maybe it's around. Glad to help. Glad to help you look for it. The president busied himself inside the blind and emerged triumphantly with the tutor. Tom seized it and satisfied himself with one gentle blast that it was indeed the tutor of the miraculous reed. Isn't here, he said, removing the other from his neck cord, is one I won't need any more. Be glad to let you have it. Will you guarantee it to work, Tom? The president demanded. Tom was himself again. He had his tutor back. There came into his eyes an old twinkle, and this time I was positive he was grinning at us when he chortled. Guarantee it. <laughs> I'll guarantee it to work just as good as your darned old Applejack. Too doggone white. 
in March along the valley of Wisconsin's surging River Brule. There is a season, half spring and half winter, when ragged patches of snow linger at the feet of patient gray cedars. Though the northering sun beats warmly in the treetops, coffee brown spew stained from hemlock roots oozes down the slopes to join the rising flow. And there is a great rushing of waters along the 66 miles of the Boise Brule. The old river is on the rampage from way up beyond Stone's Bridge, clear to the mouth of Lake Superior. It's a season when discontented fishermen peer petulantly out of windows, beyond dripping eaves, and wonder if the rainbows are up. When that word is passed, all angling men of parts make haste to get to the river and inspect the annual miracle of 10 and 12 pound fish spawning almost at their feet. On a windy, warmish, coldish March day, long about tax-paying time, I had occasion to pass the place of business of the president of the old Duck Hunters Association. Mr. President was standing in his window with one I recognized immediately as Gus, six foot four Norwegian, who can and does handle an eight ounce fly rod as you and I handle one of half that weight. The president hailed me. Rainbows are up, he announced, added hurriedly, but I can't get down to see him till Sunday. Gus had brought the tidings. He had just returned from the recently dismantled South Shore Railway trestle, which spans the famous creek, near a whistling post and switch block, answering to the legendary Indian name of Winnebajou. They're up all right, Gus affirmed. By Yingo, some dandies are laying on the gravel south of the trestle. <laughs> Only Gus didn't say it just like that. His Norse accent is something that cannot be reduced to paper. You can sort of play around with that accent, but you can't pin it down. You can give a fair imitation of the way of an Irishman with a word, or a Scotchman, or almost any other good American. But I have yet to see the speech of a Gus, set down in black and white, in a manner recognizable alike to those who know the Norwegians and the Norwegians themselves. Suffice it to say that um, all the good, whole, sound, lusty, and gusty gusses pronounce yellow with a J and January with a Y. There are other little nuances which this inadequate scribe can only hint at in print. But before we go farther and to justify and glorify the gusses of this world, let all be advised that when they hear someone saying January, instead of January, they should listen closely, for that fellow is more than likely to know a lot about fishing. There, in the president's garage, the chimes of memory started ringing in Gus's honest head. One thing led to another, and almost before we knew it, Gus was launched on a favorite tale. He began it in the little office of the president's establishment, but halfway through, all hands moved into the more spacious showroom to give Gus elbow room. And striding back and forth among the shining cars, Gus made that tale live and breathe. Gentlemen, we give you Gus. There's just one bait to use in spring. What is it? Salmon eggs. You does priest what I could do down there today with one yar of salmon eggs and a Colorado spinner. Of course, it being illegal, you won't find me there by Yingo. You take a little spinner and throw away the hooks. Put on big bass hooks. Then, when you've got a fish, you've got him. Yes, sorry. Anyhow, I was going to mention about that day down by the dry landing. It was opening day. 6,000 fishermen from Winnebago down to McNeil's. I had two small ones, but they were, oh, about three pounds apiece. And I ain't gone home opening day with sardines. There's a pretty good hole down there. I came up to it, you does. Sixteen fishermen on sixteen poles. Yiminy! I waited. They tried everything. Salmon eggs, spinners, worms, bucktail streamers. 
I waited a good hour, and they all left, one by one. Then I stepped in. Gentlemen, when Gus steps in, he steps into places where you and I would need a boat. There in the showroom, we saw Gus easing himself out into the sacred pool, the water gurgling about his barrel chest. I knew that hole all right, Gus continued. I hadn't fished it 25 years for nothing. There I was. Out goes the first cast. All I had on was three salmon eggs with a spinner above. I let him slide down to the end of the hole where the water went faster. Nothing. Once again, all this was acted, not just spoken. Gus strode from car to car. His huge feet thumped the showroom floor. His ruddy face grew ruddier with the zest of impending combat. Out, I sent it again. Gus went on, eyes gleaming. Down to the end of the hold, then oop. What's that now, huh? Comes on the spinner a little tick. Ah, so he's there, huh? Ah, yeah, you wait, Mr. Rainbow. You and me, we're going to do business. Third time I cast out, felt same tick. I struck, but nothing happened. A wise one, that Rainbow, stealing my salmon eggs. Strategy is what he needs. I put on new salmon eggs and cast again, tick. Then I got bright idea. Instead of striking, I leaned over. Now when Gus leans over, it's like seeing the Tower of Pisa tip farther. I leaned over and let them go down in there again. Drift cast. I let him go two or three feet beyond where he was ticking at. I knew the fish would follow so as not to miss those salmon eggs. I hoped it would work by Yemeni. You hope so too as you listen. But you're pretty sure it will because Gus has told you the tale a dozen times. And he tells it so well that people clear away furniture to hear it again and again in all its primal splendor. There is Gus, huge arms, holding imaginary rod, chest deep in the flow, swishing between the display automobiles. The air becomes tense, the moment is at hand. Just at the high time, I felt a tick. I knew he'd followed it downstream. I knew he was turned in another direction. Right there, I give it to him, and you just breeze. Gus almost went backward over a projecting bumper as he fought the big rainbow. But he got the trout into the open between two deluxe models and fought it out there, even to the point of standing proudly at the end of the fight, holding the flopping giant aloft in triumph. Great people, those Gusses of the northern parts of our lake states, where you find good fishing, you'll find plenty of Norwegians and Swedes. They excel at the game, either as commercial or sport fishermen. They are anglers from the word go and tough as old get out. The kind of lads the Big Ten coaches smile at when they report in September for the football team. Plenty of them have lugged the pigskin for Wisconsin and Minnesota, and plenty more of them will by Yemeni. Uh, Gus is not only tall, but proportioned. He used to fish with a pint-sized pal whom he carried through the deep holes on his back. Legend hath it, Gus would stop from time to time and let his comrade whip the waters from this magnificent perch. Gus departed. Mr. President pulled out his watch. It was 2 p.m. He said, if we jump in the car and run down there right now, the sun will be about right and see the big rainbows either off the South Shore Trestle or from the front of the St. Paul Club. But I thought, never mind thinking my taxes are due tomorrow, my dandruff's bothering me, my chill brains are peeling, and besides, I haven't been outdoors to speak of since last duck season. Come on! An hour and a half later, the president firmly fastened the single button of the old brown Mackinac and strode forth upon the creaking ties of the ancient trestle to be present at Act One, Scene One of the Great Rainbow Drama, or Why Life is Worth Living for Fishermen. This first glimpse of the big lunkers from Lake Superior in the Brule 
is one of the Middle West's most dramatic and visible fish migrations. Smelt along the Lake Michigan shores provide another spectacle. And still another is that amazing run of walleye pike up the Wolf River of Wisconsin from Lake Winnebago in April. You can see those newly arrived rainbows as they come up, whereas the smelt only run at night and the walleyes are deep goers. Hence the charm of this brutal spectacle. I have seen at one time as many as 50 persons staring down into the brule, 40 feet beneath them from that old South Shore trestle. You first see the fish as mere wavering shadows. The eye becomes adjusted to the riffle. And from a vantage point, you begin to get their outlines in detail. But the O's and ahs are reserved for the moment when a big crimson-streaked female rolls on her side and vibrates from stem to stern, apparently hastening the ejection of eggs. Then the startling color of the fish is plainly visible, after which the fish resumes its equilibrium and once more becomes a wavering shadow. Of course, no fishing is permitted then, fishing for those big fellows that sometimes lie by the score in a space no bigger than a large room would be sheer murder. Poachers, netters, and spearers once reaped a bountiful harvest from the brule. But vigilantes from game clubs, working with alert wardens, now keep nightly springtime watchers along the stream. One violator got in so deep that he spent a year in the state prison. Perhaps as severe a penalty for a game law violation as Wisconsin has ever seen. The rainbow run up the brule is something more than a movement of a splendid game fish. Poems have been written about it. People come from several hundred miles before the season opens to see the big fellows. Natives know it as a sure sign of spring. This is related so that you may know what sort of pilgrimage called the president from his daily chores at tax-paying time. Right there on the old trestle, the season opened for the old Duck Hunters Association. Thus it has begun for thousands of North Country anglers. It's not for us here to record the dragging days thereafter, nor the disorderly heaps of tackle laid out for overhauling, nor the endless remembering and the hopeful boastings that ensued between that day and the chill bright dawn of May 1st, when the season opened. It need be reported only that the old duck hunters were there on time. A delicate achievement in itself, made possible by adjusting the getaway with precise calculation of sunrise time and allowing just so many minutes for breakfast, packing, and deep prayer. The only delay occurred when the association halted for a few minutes on a sticky clay road and helped push one of the brethren from a frost boil that had shattered the road's center. That accomplished, no less than 30 cars plunged swiftly through the wallow, labored out the other side, and sped off Bruleward. You've got to see that opening day assault upon the Brule to appreciate it. There are places where you can escape the multitude, even on opening day. You can, for instance, go in by canoe on the 15 miles of water from Stones Bridge to Winnebajou and not see anyone for miles. But because it is canoe water and somewhat inaccessible, by far the great majority prefers to answer the roll call of the faithful in waders. The president voted against a canoe, and we parked with a hundred other cars in a Winnebago clearing not far from the old trestle. It was Mr. President's idea to elbow right in. Let's try it and have some fun. The report must be submitted that it was not a great deal of fun at that particular place. One reach of river, perhaps a hundred yards long, was accommodating 20 to 30 fishermen. Upstream, the concourse of fishermen diminished, but it was bad enough. These gatherings do produce fun, however. Everyone knew everyone else, and those who did not soon got acquainted. In such a crowd, someone is bound to hook a good one or two. But the old duck hunters emerged from the stream at noon with nothing to show for their labor and planning. On the sunny side of a twisted cedar, the president spread sandwiches, uncorked hot coffee, and held council. Halfway through the third sandwich, when I was suggesting we forget the big fellows and go after some fun and small ones on the upper reaches, the president looked up suddenly with more than casual interest. Ah, 
On yonder well-worn fisherman's trail, he said, comes the answer to our problems. It was Gus. But he was despondent. Even three cups of coffee, which he drank scalding and straight, and liberal applications of sandwiches did nothing to cheer him. He said he had been all over this our river since sunup, first near the mouth, down by Judge Lenroots, and at four or five other places. And there's a fisherman on every hold between here and Lake Superior by Yingo. Had he seen any good ones? He had indeed. John Ziegler had one close to ten pounds. Carl Tarsrud had two of them, maybe five and six pounds. Clarence Grace hadn't done so badly. All our surefire brule fishermen. Gus said he had seen maybe fifty rainbows of five pounds or over. But by Yimini, I can't find a hole that hasn't been tramped. He said he was quitting. That he'd come back the following day when the opening day crew had departed. It's a fact that this opening day rush on the Brule fades to practically nothing within a day or two. No Wisconsin stream can match it for the first day. We think the boys like to make a ceremony of it and then go there many ways on hundreds of miles of other good streams all over the northern end of the state. Gus was no sooner out of sight when the president swept the luncheon remnants together, grabbed that gear, and with his mouth still stuffed, urged, we're following that boy, hurry. I saw his car over in the grove a minute ago. No fool, the honorable president. He explained while we skulked along the trail trying to appear unhurried that Gus never in his life quit a stream until it was too dark to fish, that wherever Gus was heading now would be all right with us. And furthermore, that following Gus was perfectly legitimate as also was Gus' attempt to veil his real intent. Now, all honest fishermen will understand the code. You get what you're good enough to take, with due consideration for bag limits, the folks you are dealing with, and your own immortal honor. We watched Gus back out his car and followed along unobserved on a county trunk running parallel to the river. In the town of Brule, rainbow trout capital of Wisconsin, where the famous from Presidents Cleveland through Coolidge and Hoover have passed, Gus halted his throbbing engine long enough to clump into Hank Denny's restaurant. From the bulge of his lower lip, when he reappeared, we guessed he had laid in a new stock of snooze, or snuff, if you're unfamiliar with this tidbit, or if you are familiar with it, Norwegian dynamite. It was easy to trail Gus because of the heavy traffic. He passed the road into the old Banks place and the one down to the N.P. Johnson Bridge. We thought he might have turned at these places with the idea of hanging around until fishermen had quit certain holes. But Gus had another spot in mind. Traffic thinned and Gus turned left down a road that we knew well, a road not too safe at that season of frost boils when red clay seethes and softens. Gus must have known it was a long shot he was taking no one else had braved that road during the day. It was ticklish work. You slide down one hog back and bluff your way up the next, wheels flinging red clay chunks 20 feet high into the popple trees. At the bottom of a steep hill, we found Gus, mired. We climbed out, we gave aid, we spoke frankly of our intentions. Gus laughed, Gus always laughs. With me driving and Gus pushing, we made the hill with both cars, slid down the next descent, and there we were, practically on the bank of the Brule. Well, said Gus, chuckling as we surveyed the river, I don't know, but what it serves me right to sneak away from you and get stuck. The Brule at this point, only a few miles from the big lake, was yellowed with red clay, washed down from eroding banks that stretched along the river some distance back from its mouth. Gus remarked that a trout could use a pair of glasses to advantage. Murky water has never bothered the president much. He holds it gives an angler an advantage, permitting him to work water more searchingly without frightening fish. All things considered, he'd take a royally crick to one gin clear, and he's not entirely a bait fisherman either. In its upper reaches, by the way, the brule runs gin clear the year round. The place where we put in is below what is known as McNeil's Hole. The McNeil Farm lies along the Brule Bottoms. Below a bridge at this point, the river bends sharply to the east, then turns again straight north. 
and before caroming off a high bank to the west, idles a while in a long, deep hold. The old duck hunters love that place. The biggest steelhead I ever saw actually taken from the river came out of that hole on the end of Mr. President's leader. It was a seven-pounder, and I mean steelhead. A fish identified carefully later by E.M. Lambert, superintendent of the fabulous Pierce's state upstream. Lambert knows a steelhead from a rainbow, but he cannot tell at a glance, and neither can anyone else. All you can do is guess. The steelhead is likely to be whiter. But beyond that, the boys who know go into the matter by counting scales. However, this is no place to discuss that. There was work at hand. I went upstream and worked down under the bridge and around the corner with salmon eggs and a spinner. No fun? Well, gentlemen, as Gus would say, there are times when the water is too damn wet for dry flies. I creeled a few small rainbows and worked toward the big pool which Gus and the president had fished. The latter had a nice four-pound rainbow. A dark, deep-bodied, typical Brule rainbow with a pronounced crimson sash down his side. Gus was out there waist-deep, working everything in his catalog for another. He had seen roll like a porpoise by Yemeni. He was white as a ghost, Gus yelled at me from midstream. Maybe I can get him. The old duck hunters watched the show. It's always a show to watch Gus. He can wade almost any place on the Brule. That rugged river holds no terrors for him. His powerful legs stand against its brawling push where other legs would wobble and shake. He was using his best formula, salmon eggs and spinner. You who have not fished the brule, you who have only read about it, should see it with one like Gus performing in its center. <laughs> it was getting on toward late afternoon. The warmth of the May sun was being dissipated by the familiar chill that rises from the brule on the hottest days. Gus stood in almost five feet of water, the yellow flow nipping his wader tops. He nursed the snooze in his lower lip and practiced his art. I saw the fish roll once to the spinner. It was indeed stark white, as Gus had said, a good sign to the layman that it was a true steelhead. The old duck hunter smoked and watched, conscious of imminent drama. Finally, it happened. Gus' rod arm went forward and down. He hooks him that way. Then the arm was back up and throbbing, and something hard and white and crazy exploded from the pool 40 feet away. Gus back toward shallow water. The big white fish ran upstream and leaped many times. They will do it before you can think. From the pool came a snooze muffled roar, such a one as Gus' Viking ancestors might have bellowed in a foray on the Irish coast a thousand years ago. You dus, I got him, he snorted, to which the president of the old duck hunters added fervently, Yiminy whiskers, Gus, give him snooze. Snooze it was in the first, second, and third degrees of the battle of the raging two and four, of the unbelievable strength in six pounds of fresh-run steel head, of the great grunts and snorts from Gus, there's little need for setting down. Suffice it to say, the fish took Gus downstream 50 yards, came back into the pool, and dogged and bucked and leaped and writhed and rolled on the leader until he was washed up. All these things have been reported many times. No fish in Wisconsin will exhibit the electric insanity of a hooked steelhead in fast water. After about 20 minutes, there was the ghost white fish on the tiny shelving sand beach at the edge of the pool. And there were two grand old fishermen shaking hands. And there was an ancient gunny sack extracted from Gus jacket. Into this, the big fish went the mightiest of Wisconsin trout rivers had once more flashed its beaming smile upon the old duck hunters. Indeed, it was a chalky fish. Along the lateral line, there was hardly more than the faintest wash of crimson. You looked closely to see it. All the rest of him was white, bluish in places, but white. The sign of the steelhead. A sign we could check later with Emmett Lambert, the Brule's grand old authority, if we so desired. Lambert could take measurements and say what he was. For the present, there was only supreme content 
among the old duck hunters. Gus dipped a blunt forefinger into the round box and spread a damp layer of snooze under a quivering lower lip. It is something to see a six-foot-four Norwegian trembling. Fact is, we were all trembling. And you will, too, if you ever come to grips with one of those Lake Superior submarines. The president got out his omnipresent thermos bottles and passed around hot coffee. His own rainbow, a nice little fish, was forgotten for the larger one. A native with a long cane pole and a sad look wended toward us from McNeil's bridge. To his hail, anything doing? Gus extracted the still writhing steelhead from the sack and held it high over his head by its lower jaws. The native's eyes popped. He was about to say something when the steelhead contorted in a quick spasm, wrenched free and dropped into the pool. Gus lumbered toward the fish, scooping desperately. The fish rolled and slithered out of his grasp and then with new strength shot like a torpedo for deep water. No one spoke for perhaps a half minute. The president's coffee spilled from its cup. I shall never forget the gone feeling that hit me. The native seemed sadder than ever. All eyes were on Gus. For only an instant, his face was tragic. And then he grinned. A grin that wrinkled and spread and warmed his great red face and lighted it with something you seldom see on the face of a man in such extremity. He spoke, well, boys, he was a pretty good fish. But damn it, I didn't like his color. He was too doggone white. Too doggone white. <laughs> that from a fisherman who had felt his heart turn a handspring in his throat. Do you wonder why I love those Norse fishermen? Gentlemen, this reporter begs a last line. When all the fishing is over for Gus, when he will no longer hear the kingfishers screaming along the stream, when all that remains of him is a magnificent legend of a great-hearted fisherman, the old duck hunters will write an epitaph for Gus. And this is what it'll be. Too doggone white. We shall gather by the ice house. There are corners of this green footstool which men look upon with more than mere gratefulness. Places where they feel deeply at home. Let all of them choose their own inviolate acres, along the banks of the raging Rogue, or in the pine-clad hills of Alabama. All of the close-to-earth hunting and fishing men know their chosen places. My chosen corner is scrubby enough, even the president of the old duck hunters has joked, I doubt if the Indians would take it back if we offered it to them. But his talk fools nobody. For the chosen corner, a man is always ready to fight. One day, Mr. President suggested that we cease exploring the far partridge cover of North Wisconsin and get back to first principles. He suggested that we shove off in the briar-proof pants and the far-going boots for the best darn partridge country in Wisconsin, which starts right at your doorstep on the middle Eau Claire Lake. He referred, of course, to Benassa Umbellus, the fan-tailed powerhouse known all through upper Wisconsin as plain old partridge. All right, I said, for I have always retained a formal vote in affairs of the old Duck Hunters Association, even though his word is law. That was in the early bird season we have here in Wisconsin. Not to be confused with the late season, when leaves are gone and birds are sought in frostier weather. But we never did get together in that early season. Other things intervened. We met in late October, when the scrub was afire with purples and reds, in the manner that scarlet oak preserves its glory long after color has fled from less tenacious trees. We met at my shack on the middle lake at sunup. It had been a long drive for me, some three hours of hunching over the wheel, figuring out a nasty ground fog. The president, who tolerates and even loves me after his kind, 
and who was waiting there for me when the sun rolled up over the Norways across the lake, said that I looked like a saucer of cool coffee with too much cream in it. He also said that it was a caution the way folks nowadays tear hell-bent around the country at all hours. And would I come into the house and consume A, three scrambled eggs, B, eight rashers of home-smoked bacon, C, four cups of coffee, and D, a hat full of oven-hard toast? I would. He sat there and laughed at me, puffing on his crooked pipe. He's always laughed at me. I'm flattered by it. Mostly when he's laughing at me, he's scheming up some way to teach me about partridge or mallards or of mice and men or how to hang a deer without breaking my back. One of the nice things about owning my own shack in that country is that I am always a guest when the president is on hand. The place is just like the country around it. Everything fits in like old boots and wool socks. I got up from his repast and seized dishes, but he stopped that instantly. How many times? Must I tell you, never to be caught washing dishes in October early in the morning. A complex man, you might say. On the other hand, you might say he is merely a man with common sense. At any rate, the dishes were abandoned over my objections, which drew from him the suggestion that if I was so damn neat, I could stay home and darn some socks for him. There we were, on that sparkly morning, surveying from the stoop of the shack a world of such benign goodness that even the red squirrels wouldn't cuss it. We stood there on the stoop, each in his briar-proof pants, each with a shotgun under the arm. His honor looked up, the glory of sunlight on frosted pines, and recalled, only fellow I ever wanted to hang worked in my garage. One morning I heard him say, take a look out the window, that damn sun is shining again. I fired him. And then he added, I got this all planned. You take the thoroughfare country, and I'll work south and west below you and meet you by the old ice house on Libby Bay at sunset. I protested. He was giving me the best country. He was also giving himself a terrific walk and possibly a wading with gun, boots, and pants held aloft across the river-like thoroughfare which connects two lakes. Do as I say, he directed. You'll see some birds and some ducks, too. I've had my fling down there. In case I'm ahead of you, I'll leave a note tucked into one of the logs on the ice house. And then he left me. No use to protest further. He took a firmer grip on his shotgun and strode up the sandy rising road. To the south lay an undulating country grown to scrub oak and jack pine, with low spots of spruce and tamarack, and here and there some isolated stands of magnificent Norways. My job, as directed, was to push through the scrub cover and explore vagrant hardwood patches for roughed grouse. Then I was to cross the thoroughfare bridge and explore the very rugged hills lying east and south of the thoroughfare before they fell off gradually to the lake. A fetching prospect. I realized that after I was on the way over country so crisscrossed with deer trails that whenever one was lost, another going the same direction could be found in a few seconds. I realized, too, that Mr. President had been more than generous. But then... That's his way. It takes such a philosopher as the president of the old duck hunters to perceive that a man should renew acquaintanceship on his own with beloved country. Only when a fellow is very young or when he is greatly uplifted does he experience the spiritual exaltation of such glorious morning expeditions, such bright solitary rambles in the morning remind one of long gone days when the circus came to town and a fellow got up shivering in the dawn to hit the canvas boss for a job the shaded earth under the trees was frosty damask in the jack pine tops the sun varnished a billion needles it was easy to find the way I'd been there many times in all seasons ahead of me in that dip I'd worked my first hunting dog. Beyond, in still lower ground, I'd made a double on Partridge. Farther on was a place where 
I'd missed a standing buck. In the first big Norway grow, four partridges dynamited out of the sunny open ground beneath the round, ruddy bowls. They made it safely to dense cover. I thought ejecting the two shells, it was a good thing Mr. President was not around to see that sort of performance. The grove did not let me down entirely. The four fast birds had thrown me into gear, so that when a single roared out thirty yards beyond, I cut him down just in time. Hunting men know the feeling. On your own, with your own worn shotgun, best of all, in your own country. The kind of country so familiar that you feel like tipping your hat to old landmarks. And they say folks won't fight for that. This was one of those peak partridge years such as Wisconsin has had for three seasons. Um, these are years of huge coveys, when bag limits are easy. I wondered how Mr. President was getting along. I wondered if he were completely happy without me there to be bossed. I wondered if his aging legs were taking it all right. And laughed aloud then for I have yet to see the cover which his whipcord thighs cannot bust. After the Norway Grove, there was the edge of the thoroughfare. This is a good hunting space for about a half mile. Paper birches and young Norway pines contest to see which shall win. In this place, the well-worn deer trails are closer together than ever. So help me, there was a partridge in a cherry tree. It sat as I approached and I waited for it to steam out. It did, too. It steamed right over my head, so close that I feared to fire. My only alibi is that I didn't have a chance. I didn't even let go with a speculative right barrel as it darted through the branches. I worked that half-mile patch dutifully. I went south by the thoroughfare, negotiating the lumpy hills and the whippy brush. But I encountered only birds flushing wild, fifty yards ahead, which is as good as a thousand yards away in that cover. Back along the thoroughfare, I went to the little hump-backed bridge. There I stopped to look down into six feet of clear water, where some good smallmouths were still occupying the bridge hole. One sunny afternoon in this hole with a yellow feather minnow, a Ah, enough of that. This is hunting. I crossed the bridge and studied the winding sand trail before me, trying to keep my eyes at their best wide-angle aperture so as to be ready for roadside birds. I seldom fail here. Two partridge blasted out of a wet spot where I've been wont to dig angle worms in summer. And while I shot, I wondered if they like worms. Just a, like a woodcock. After picking up my bird, I looked at the damp, spaded ground. No earthworms were in sight. And after that, there were more hills, heavily grown, hills of popple, both standing and down stuff, hills with thick growths of young Norways, hills as bare as your hand, except for sedge grasses. It was in one of these sloping, sedgy places that a veritable multitude of sharp tails leaped out. Being in a quick reflex partridge hunting mood, I caught one as he set his wings to float into distant cover. Sure, I should have doubled, but his fluffy, speckled highness contrasted well with the partridge already suspended at my belt by a cord. Now I was on the opposite side of the thoroughfare. The autumn morning was building itself into a symphony. The president had mentioned something about ducks in the thoroughfare. So, for perhaps a half hour, I Indian hunted the thoroughfare edge, taking advantage of high grass and clumps of popple and birch. My mind was completely off upland birds when a single partridge roared out from my left and was gone in a flash. <laughs> I kicked myself for not being ready, but it's always so. One thing at a time, they do say, is the way for a hunter to hunt. I think that if I'd been hunting partridge, I'd have nailed that fellow. But my mind was on what might materialize from the thoroughfare, in close, where succulent grasses could be reached by tip-up ducks. Near the end of my riverbank beat, at a place where I used to bet nickels with Mr. President as to which side of a log a snapping turtle would jump off, I heard a faint gabble. It was indeed faint, 
but not far off. The grass smothered the sound. I worked toward it. The sound grew. One Gabby Hen Mallard was simply telling everything to the whole neighborhood. When I got quite close, I could hear the cautious me of a drake. Maybe he was chiding her for her garrulity. He should have borne down harder, considering what happened. Through the grass, I made out three mallards, all in range. I exchanged the seven and a halfs, new crimps, for chilled sixes. Then I waited, enjoying the spectacle reserved for the sneak hunter who gets close enough to study him without being detected. The three increased to five. The five increased to nine. By that time, I was thinking that when they jumped, it would be a good idea to pick a crossing shot with the first barrel. Perhaps I could have stalked within 10 yards of them, but the tension was growing. At 25 yards, I stood up. The hen quit gabbling. There was that still as death pause, which comes when the gauntlet is down. They bounded out, and the crossing shot clicked perfectly for a hen and a drake. But so quickly were they making way that the choke barrel had to reach for the third bird, another drake. He slanted in his fall and provided me with a 75-yard wading job in water not half as warm as the Indian summer air. Drying blue-cold legs, I had a moment to gloat upon the bag. Meager enough, but a great and varied treasure there in the sunny brown grass by the thoroughfare. A treasure from my very own country. Isn't that the whole box score in a nutshell? Isn't it simply that all of us like to go once in a while to our own home acres and collect with judicious rod and careful gun the respective crops as they accumulate with the seasons? East of the thoroughfare, beyond tangled northern woods and rough hills, jackstrawed with timber, there spread a stretch of blue water. It's the upper end of the lake or Libby Bay. Naturally, I thought more of it after the encounter with the mallards. I hit the cover on the way to the lake and picked off another partridge. Once I bragged to a fellow that in one season I never missed a partridge on the wing. Not having grown up with these birds, he was distinctly skeptical. He still is. I don't blame him. What I meant was that I never missed one that I was ready for. This third bird was, I suppose, a cock. Anyway, he was big, the feather pattern on his breast went all the way across, and he wore a continuous dark band across his tail. Let him argue if they choose, I think he was a cock. The lake burst upon me as I topped a hill strewn with downed popple. These were victims of erratic, tornadic winds, which sometimes float off their northward course, going up the Mississippi, and find their way along the feeder streams to the Big Creek striking here and there. From the hilltop I saw the stretch of lake known as Libby Bay. And there, riding the little waves and soaking in the sun, were significant black dots. Bluebills, of course. Fattest, swiftest, huskiest ducks for their inches that fly upon the face of the North American continent. I skirted the clean, sandy edge of the lake and occupied a blunt point of land where Libby Bay had its largest indentation of the shoreline. Ducks were not moving to any extent. Only now and then would a restless single break away. I sprawled in soft sand beneath jack pines crowding the lake edge. It was warm. Spiders labored inches from my nose. I settled the shotgun in the jack pine branches and lay back. Hands under head, I drowsed like the ducks. Maybe a couple would fly over, maybe. Now, as I write it, I cannot tell what awakened me. It may have been the sand, which cools quickly under a man in October. But then it may have been the knifing whistle of short, swift wings overhead. Anyway, before I could manage to come alive, a flock of about 20 bluebills was over me and gone. But there were new sounds in the upper air to soothe my sense of defeat. New and magic sounds growing stronger. No need to tell how it is. 
The bald facts are that another flock was busting across my blunt nose point with a confidence learned from weeks of doing the same thing without endangering themselves. The point is a shortcut from Mid Libby Bay and its wild celery to the lower thoroughfare and another lake where more celery grows. Here was a situation calling for calculation. No dog to retrieve down birds in deep water. No boat within two miles. I waited until the birds were well over the point. Two of them hit the sandy ground with that lead-weighted thump, which all bluebill shooters know. Well, partridge, a chicken, mallards, two drakes, a couple of those ocean-going tugs known as bluebills. His honor himself would approve such a nicely balanced bag. He would size them up critically and say, mm, not too many. Just enough. It was time for me to push back along the lake shore to the ice house rendezvous. No more hunting now, just going home. Just a familiar old dilapidated ice house with Mr. President waiting there to take the wind out of my sails. No more tense muscles. Let the partridge leap out if they wished. They were safe. This was the armistice at the end of the day, which is declared by hunting men in favor of their dearest enemies. Walking along with the weight at my belt, I remembered what Mr. President had said about home. I don't know. I always like to go away. I always like to come back. The sun got well down. Purple built up in the east. I saw a grand buck. I hit the clearing by the old ice house, hoping Mr. President would be there. He'd be company for the mile hike homeward. He was not there. But he had been there. His tracks were unmistakable in the soft sand before the ice house door. His message was written on a shell box, tucked in a log crack. I'm going on ahead to start the coffee. That was all. Upstream, downstream. I will not go upstream and fish that gin clear water with a spinner on the first day of any season. It was Al himself, more or less famous president of the old duck hunter speaking, alias Rainbow Al from May 1 to September 1. You'd rather sling spinners in the soup down near Lake Superior then? I asked. My boy quoth the sage of the North Country. There are two ways to fish the Brule River in the early season. One is with flies up above, where it's clear. The other is with spinners down below, where it's dis... The first way, you get nothing but a sore wrist from casting. The second way, you hook at least one great big fish that may smash your tackle and break your heart. If it's a big rainbow, it's a red-letter day. If it's a big steelhead... It's a red-letter day, and you get a stiff wrist to boot. Your Honor, said I sorrowfully, you are a sinful and wanton fish hog. For several years now you have eschewed the plebeian spinner and worms in favor of the aristocratic dry fly in all seasons. And here you are, backsliding, like any regenerate after a revival. Where is your sense of decency? None. The call of the big guy is too strong, replied Al. I long to spin a splinter in the dark waters of McNeil's pool. But think of the fun upstream with flies, especially dry flies. Yes, it might be more fun, he admitted reluctantly. I saw that he was weakening and pressed on with my best argument. An invitation to visit a friend who had a special road of his own leading into the upstream waters of the 66-mile river. So we went upstream, but I could see as we climbed into waders that he was pessimistic. Ice still lingered around some cedar tree roots as we invaded the dank river valley. Not very encouraging for a fly fisherman who had hoped for months to try out some new flies and some new very light opaque leaders. Heavy waders and extra socks inside gave a welcome warmth until we stepped into the river. We separated, each to pursue his opening day luck in the moving flood of ice water. The veteran strode off with resolute steps for some special places downstream, while I waded through a stretch of mud bottom 
to the current washed stones of midstream, intending to work upward with dry flies, for a while at least. The shadows on the brule were pretty long, but the sun was bright behind the cedars, giving promise of warmth later on. Someone ought to invent waders with fur-lined pockets for early season fishing. There just isn't any place where one may take the chill out of numbed fingers, unless he folds his arms over his breast and tucks his digits into his armpits, and a fellow must hang on to his rod. The cold penetrated to the marrow, through waders, heavy socks, and Mackinaw pants. Every so often I was compelled to get out of the water and perch on a rock in Napoleonic pose until circulation was restored sufficiently to permit another go at it. For a good two hours, I fished a 50-yard stretch that invariably produces good browns and rainbows, and not only saw no rises, but did not see a sign of a fish in the water. The lingering chill of winter seemed to have laid a killing hand upon the stream, although I knew there should be lots of Lake Superior run rainbows lying in every pool. Search as I would, I could see no sign of any insect life on the water. If the fish saw the brown by visible, plain coachman, and badger by visible that I laid down over them, they gave no sign. I worked with the carefulness of the conscientious early season practitioner. The way one can apply himself to the tediousness of form is remarkable for the first few trips of the season, but the fish responded not. When I reached the head of the pool, I retraced my steps, and after waiting several minutes again, fished upstream with a favorite of mine, a small, wet, royal coachman, well dunked before beginning, and fished as deep as I could get it to go. But nothing happened. Which may be a poor way to start a fishing story, but adheres quite strictly to the facts. I did take courage, however, for I am one of those superstitious anglers who feels that the day starts auspiciously when everything doesn't happen all at once. Several river canoes passed me, headed downstream, and I pitied the passengers. Most of them were purple-lipped and shivering as they sat in their boats, carried along by the current. One boat came along bearing two anglers who usually take fish, and they told me they'd not even seen a fish rise since they started at 4 a.m. I felt licked. When those two gentlemen don't get them, not many others do. But it's always darkest just before the dawn. It was getting warmer. The sun was flooding the valley. And although the lower half of me was congealed, I could take comfort in the upper half being fairly warm. I quit the stream and took to the woods, aiming for a popular spot where the river is divided by an island and the two chutes come together in a fast flow of water. Scores of rainbows had been spawning here a few weeks before. A friend occupied the head of the pool and was going good with the Colorado spinner and angleworms. He had three rainbows. I left him and continued upstream, through the difficult timber that flanks both sides of the brool. There's one nice thing about that path of the river. There are no paths worn by anglers, which is in its favor. The sun had me pretty well thawed out the next time I launched myself into the river, at the lower end of a slow stretch, the head of which is a famous pool. Out over the tail of the pool went the brown by visible time and again, with no results. Fishermen passing me in canoes occasionally expressed amazement that I should be trying dry flies. I will never forget the satisfaction I experienced when one of them saw my fly sailing by attached to that new opaque leader. He could not see the leader and asked me if I had not snapped off the fly. If a man could not see it, perhaps a fish could not either. I gradually worked up until I was casting over water that must have been five feet deep. When a leader that you had hoped would prove invisible is actually invisible to an old trout hawk, it tends to buoy you up. With more faith in myself and my outfit, I worked the by visible persistently, carefully, time after time, until my arm ached, and that's hard work if one has neither seen a fish rise or leap. The brown by visible, incidentally, appeals to me as a good fly to use when in doubt or any other time. There is nothing in insect life like it, 
but the white twist of hackle dancing over the water enables the angler to see it better. At that, I believe it would not have been necessary to watch the fly closely in order to hook the fish that finally did rise to it. It was a heavy brown, and never was there a more deliberate, confident attack upon a fly. The fish seemed to have been lying directly beneath it and took it with very little commotion on the surface. When he felt the line, he dived into the deepest water of the hole, running into the current to do it. A heavy windstorm of last summer had blown a cedar tree into the hole. Part of the tree was still green, its roots clinging tenaciously to the soil. But I knew that a lot of tree was underwater, right where Mr. Brown was headed for. I put on all the pressure that I dared, and he came out, came out strong, going downstream. He made one glistening leap, during which I saw his every spot, and then nosed into the bottom in a series of powerful jerks. After that, he was mine. I let him play dog in the shallower water, halted a few desperate attempts to get back into the hole with the tree in it, and finally netted him. He measured 18 inches. Then I forgot about the cold water entirely. Here were fish that would rise to a fly. Here was opportunity, pleasure, thrill, sport. How glad I was that I had persuaded the Honorable Mr. Al to come upstream with me. Now things were different. Every cast found me looking forward to a rise. Now every inch of the water seemed to give promise of a fish. So does the first fish of the season establish within one that most uncertain of fishermen's foibles, faith, without which no fish are caught and no fun is had. After a rest of about 15 minutes, I had begun to retrieve my cast when the second fish shot out from beneath the submerged cedar trees and struck where the fly had been. I saw him as he lifted surfaceward. My heart beat fast. I know now that I should have waited, but I could not. A few false casts and the bivisible settled down in the center of the rippling circles where the trout had broken water. My fish had not gone home after the first try, but he started for home the minute he seized the fly on the next try, and once more I risked the light leader to keep him out of the drowned tree. I think I had right there as good an opportunity as I ever had to compare the fighting qualities of the brown and the native brook trout and the native winds over the brown. Attribute it to the colder water, if you will, with the explanation that the brookie was more at home there. But this does not satisfy me. The brown was a bigger fish, I learned eventually. The native proved to be about two inches shorter than the brown. And while he remained underwater and fought the dogged, persistent fight of the typical brook trout, it must be recorded the fight was a good one. I did not catch a glimpse of him until he was netted. Not often nowadays that one can stretch out a fat 16-inch native square tail on a rock. Back at it again, I went. It was getting along toward noon, and the occasional canoes passing me headed downstream contained more cheerful passengers. Up in Durant's channel, a man had taken two rainbows. In the rips above Cedar Island, another had used to fly effectively on eight nice browns and rainbows. And all along the stream, the first day fiends were reporting things as looking up, with fish rising and a hatch of something or other appearing. More confident than ever, I returned to the fray with a new brown by visible. How I came to love that fly. I moved around to a glassy slide where the water emptied into the pool. The current here was not fast, but much faster than that in the pool. And the work of casting and handling was, therefore, faster and more tiring. I stood so that the fly would alight about 25 feet above where the sharp break of the water occurred and let the fly slide down into the slower water. Faith was bolstered now with past experience, as I knew fish usually lay there, especially toward evening, and it was shallow enough so that a fish would not have to strain his eyesight upward to catch sight of the fly. The third trout was on and away down the slide into the pool before I realized what was happening. He must have known about the drowned cedar tree, 
but so did I. The leader held him from wrecking me in the tree. So he continued on downstream, and I scrambled after as well as I could, shipping only a little water as I skirted the edge of the pool in record time. He got out of the slower water into faster water, however, and lay broadside to the current, the better to fight the hated line that held him. I would not have been too sorry if he had beaten me just then. But when I finally netted him, I was doubly glad. He was another native, just about like the first. Later on, he and his kind will have abandoned that part of the stream entirely for the colder holes in the impenetrable swamps far upstream, where in some places the sun's rays never touch the water directly. I gloated. Two big natives and a brown the first day, and they were just starting to hit the dry flies. It was after lunchtime, and I returned through the tangled woods to the starting point. In a pool fifty yards below the appointed rendezvous was Al, up to his hips in the stream and working like a nailer, with the sourest expression imaginable on his face. I hardly had the courage to tell him of my luck, but when I did, he came snorting out of the river like a disgusted hippo, took down his rod, stowed away his gear, and set out for the car. Boy, he stated finally, you and I are going downstream for meat. That is, I'm going downstream. Are you? It's my car, you know. But they're hitting dry flies here now. It's warming up. They're hitting no dry flies of mine, retaliated the enraged angler. And if I'm going to catch up with those three you have, I've got to make big medicine with a spinner and angle worms. And mark you, all I want's just one chance. Never shall it be said of me that I got licked on the brule or any other stream because it was too high hat to use bait. No, a fella can do nothing with a man like that. He got his chance. My anticipation of a glorious afternoon with flies turned to dreary consideration of how far a rainbow can see when the water is as brown as it gets down at McNeil's pool so early in the season. It was not a pleasant drive for me in one sense, for the light of battle was kindled in Al's eye, and any mention of my three fish brought prodigious snuffing and snorting and belligerent promises of what he'd do when he got where he wanted to go. The Honorable Al can be ornery without actually offending, and he doesn't get licked easily. But you're licked today, I badgered him, when he pulled up beside the big lone spruce in McNeil's meadow and saw the brown flood of the brule sweeping by. A fish can't even see a spinner in that water, I protested. Well, it works both ways, son, retorted the confirmed optimist. A fish can't see me either. In we went, drifting downstream with the current and letting spinners sweep across it before retrieving them. Spring fishing for steelheads and rainbows is the closest thing to salmon fishing that this country affords. The big rainbows from Lake Superior, which begin coming up as soon as the ice-choked mouth of the river is opened, have done as much as anything to make the river famous over the world. Rainbows of 10 pounds are not uncommon. Several over 20 pounds in weight have been taken, and the height of one monster reputed to weigh over 25 pounds is tacked on the wall of a restaurant in the town of Brule. I was leading the way in the Battle of Spinners, and I placed my greatest confidence in a long, deep pool about 200 yards below our starting place, called uh, McNeil's Pool by many fishermen. In this part of the river, one is not more than three or four miles by river from Lake Superior, and big fish are likely to be caught there the year round. One rainbow about a foot long hit my spinner and shook it free in the first leap. But no matter, there was a pool. And glory be, when I rounded the bend in the river, no one was in it, which was unusual for the opening day. I worked over the pool for about a half hour before Mr. President caught up with me. There's not a fish in it, I remarked. I was mad, of course, at the thought of missing the upstream fishing. If there's no fish in that pool, there's no fish in the brule, he answered. Therefore, your allegation is a patent falsehood, made with malicious and malevolent intent to destroy the morale of your boon companion. He doubled up his leader for greater strength. 
casting funny little glances toward me. I climbed out and sat on the bank in the sun, leaving him to his bitter task. I dislike fishing in murky water, but the faith of my companion is far greater than mine, and that's why maybe he catches usually more fish. I grew weary of watching his arm go back and then forward to send the spinner searching into every corner of the pool. I lay on my back, shielding my eyes from the sun with my hat, a picture of piscatorial contentment was getting on toward four o'clock. I heard a solid plop, like a log being dropped into the water, which was followed by an involuntary groan from Al. It caused me to sit up. Across the sun-dappled pool, I saw him pull his hat down a little more snugly and advance into deeper water. He just looked at me as though he would gladly break my neck for just sitting there and doing nothing. His stubborn lip became more stubborn, if that's possible, and he finally mumbled, no fish in this pool, huh? Was that a fish that rose? I asked. It was not a fish, he snapped. It was a crocodile, and it didn't rise either. It just lifted itself out of the water on its elbows, saw me, and fell back in terror. Now, I, I hope he bites your leg off. He declined to answer, but continued the wearying game of shooting his spinner out, letting it ride, and then retrieving. The monotony of the thing was maddening. I watched him change from spinner and worms to plain spinner, then plain worms, then salmon eggs and spinner, then, so help me, spinner with salmon eggs and worms all together. Then he went ashore and dug into his war bag for some little plugs, which he tossed around for what seemed an hour. Finally, he let the worms drag on the bottom until he caught a sucker and used a part of the sucker's belly for bait. When that didn't work, he dug still farther into his resources and produced an assortment of bucktail spinners and unnamed creations that were intended originally for bass and pike. Now, by that time, he was talking to himself, and I was actually beginning to feel sorry for him. But of such stuff are great fishermen made. After a while, I began feeling sorry for myself. I wanted to get home that day. The conviction began to grow on me that he would never go if he didn't hook the fish. I resumed my siesta on the bank. Something told me he was going to catch the darn fish. He usually did. And I was beginning to feel a little bit licked myself, maybe. I counted about 25 of the soft splashes made by his lures as they hit the pool's surface. And then I slept. He's on! It was a pleasant way to be awakened. I leaped to my feet and began running up and down the bank like an excited retriever. Al's rod was whipping furiously. One jump took the fish, a huge steelhead about four feet out of water. There are those who say Brother Steelhead and Brother Rainbow are one and the same fish in fighting ability. And there are many who claim that they are the same fish with different coloration. I have never counted the number of scales along their lateral lines. I have never compared their backbones for a count of vertebrae. I will admit further that I can't always tell them apart, but I do know this, that our friend in the pool was a steelhead. And generally speaking, he's a better man than Cousin Rainbow, which is claiming an awful lot. There was not a trace of crimson along the sides of the fish. He was out of water enough to show us that. There was no halting this fellow with a five-ounce outfit. When he finished his acrobatics in the air, he plunged into the center of the stream and started off for Lake Superior, with Al stumbling along as best he could and me following with my ridiculous little net. Then back upstream he came and flashed by us a streak of living green and dim white in the murky water. We went back with him. My arm's getting tired. The rod has creaked a little down near the butt, said Al. I don't care about the rod, but I'm afraid of the leader. Get your net and try to nail him the next time he goes by. There's an assignment for you. Try to net a big steelhead fighting mad with a little wire-rimmed brook trout net. And another man's fish? Perhaps the best fish he will catch that year? 
I began to wish I had remained asleep. The fish fell back toward us slowly and rested for a few seconds. Al risked all and horsed him toward me. I knew it was foolish, but I tried it, slipped the net over his torpedo nose and gave a heave shoreward. All I remember about that was the wire rim of the net bending in my hand as the steelhead, with a single smash that frightened me out of my wits, shot forward and was gone. No, not completely, for when I looked again, the rod was whipping madly once more, and Al's arm weariness was showing more plainly than ever in his face. But there was still hope. His lower lip was practically merged with the tip of his nose. I mean Al's lower lip. Get my net! directed Al. I unharnessed it from his shoulder while he held the steel head. All the time, he was grunting. He grunts like that when he shoots ducks, the only grunting sportsman in captivity. I stood there with the net like a ninny. More folly, I thought. But Al knew the strength of that leader. I knew that if we lost him, I'd catch it, but orders is orders in a case like that. Once more, the steelhead was coaxed toward us, and once more I corralled him in the net with his big tail and half of his body waving in my face. For the second time, the net rim bent. But this time we were not so fortunate. The big fellow darted directly between my legs. And in my haste to get out of the way, I fell flat on my face in three feet of water. As I scrambled ashore, I felt the line entangled about my wader leg, and I had presence of mind enough not to stand up straight and anchor my leg to the bottom, for that would have given the steelhead something solid to pull on. There was only one thing to do. Get ashore on all fours, like a submarine, kicking that leg violently as I went to free the line. My fly box dropped out of my wader pocket, and I made a dive for it just as I realized the line was free. I caught it and finished the job of swimming ashore. It was only a miracle that permitted me to disentangle the line, and Al had the fish fighting the rod again when I brushed the water from my eyes and looked. He was laughing like a maniac, partly at the spectacle I had presented and partly at the relief of knowing that the steelhead was still on. What'll I do now? Al called to me. Call out the Marines if you want to, I replied. I'm not going to let any steelhead drown me. Well, he'll just have to tire himself out. And it's all up to the leader, said Al. Time after time, Al worked the steelhead to within five or six feet of him. And the fish was obviously tiring. But closer than that, he would not come. The pressure was kept up until he began rolling. He looked like a peeled popple log there in the waning daylight. And then, very carefully, and with increasing speed, he was coaxed toward a sandbank. I walked around in back of him to take another dive after him if worse came to worst, but he was worn out after his twenty-minute fight. Al grabbed him quickly by the gills and snaked him ashore, and then we both fell on him. What kind of a spinner? fetched him out of his hole, I asked. For answer, Al reached into the steelhead's mouth and pulled out a long-tailed number eight bucktail fly. I knew this old mule was down here, he said. There's always one good one in this pool. He bosses the hole, and if you throw enough stuff at him, he's going to get mad finally and come out for a fight. Well, we were both right, I said. But I suppose you'd rather have fished here all day. Makes no difference to me, the old maestro answered. I'll get them if I get mad enough, upstream or downstream. And that's no fable. Minnie the Moocher. This is the story of Min, the mallard hen with the wanton wabble, and Bill, her mate, who stayed at home while men walked the streets. Praises have risen upward for many moons in adulation of inspired setters that held their point in drenching rain. 
Lyric poems have been dedicated to gallant Chesapeakes that breasted the icy tide to retrieve distant ducks. Never have I read a deserving tribute from a duck hunter who modestly thrust the crown aside and said, give the credit to Susie. She brought him in. Min and Bill, to whom I owe a shooter's debt of gratitude, brag an ancestry first recorded by man five years ago, when a pair of wild mallards, winging over a rice bed near Frederick, Wisconsin, was slightly wounded. One day an errant newspaper man came that way, and Min and Bill of the fifth generation departed the humdrum farmyard for a nobler, broader destiny. Fat they were then, and complacent with the open-handed largesse of the farmer. But their beady eyes and stiff poised necks as they hovered on the edge of the hoggish domestic fowl gave promise that all of the wildness had not been bred out of them. With the unexplainable caution that makes the mallard what he is in wisdom, they resented the farmer's approach and headed for the river. Two long, perspiring hours were spent in corralling them in a cornfield. They were clapped into a box. Before the hunt was over, the farmer had suggested shooting them, thinking I wanted them to eat. That was vetoed. I wanted them for something grander than that. Upon being incarcerated, Bill immediately showed the stuff he was made of. While men crouched in the bottom of the crate, as befits the lesser half of well-regulated households, Bill stiffened his snake-like neck and produced blood-curdling growls and ghastly hisses. Now here was something. While I haven't handled many live decoys, I never yet heard of a drake that growled. I've heard of him hissing and me amphing, but not growling. Bill growled, make no mistake about that. He growled about the way an angry dog the size of a Springer Spaniel might growl if his bone were about to be taken from him. If you placed your finger threateningly over the crate, he would raise a belligerent eye upward, fix his stare on the finger, and growl until the finger was withdrawn. Accompanying this little ceremony was a lifting of the feathers along the back of his neck. I was afraid to tell people about it. They wouldn't believe me. I consulted local duck authorities about the matter. They said they never knew a duck to growl, and mighty few of them knew of one that hissed. That, they asserted, was common among geese, but not ducks. So I went to the president of the old Duck Hunters Association. If he didn't know, he might have some kind of an explanation anyway. And it was important that I tell him about the growl, because Min and Bill were going to live in his backyard, now that Mrs. President was all through with her cold frame. Out of consideration for the President, I didn't want him to take sudden fright when walking through his own yard at night. So, you got a duck that growls? He asked, raising his eyebrows. I have, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. Well, I was afraid of something like that. You lie about the fish you catch, and I suppose it's only natural for that same undermining tendency to carry over into the duck season. He strode out to the cold frame, muttering something about the amazing untruthfulness of the younger generation. However, I proved it to him, and Min and Bill won a place in his heart instantly. We had intended to get another hen to assist Min with her main services, but the president would have none of it after hearing Bill growl. What? he demanded. You want to introduce a triangle into a family like that? I'll guarantee that when that downtrodden hen gets out there in front of the blind alone, she'll tell everything she knows about Bill. And that ought to be quite a bit. Look at her there now, slinking over in the corner, and the old man in front of her biggest life, letting on how tough he is. The president was right. Min proved to be such a gadding, gabbling creature that it was apparent we didn't need another talker. And we carefully avoided a triangle. But at that time hardly realized what lay in store for us later on when a brow-beaten Min became the central figure in a scandal that is still being quacked about in the rice beds of Washburn County. Min had about her constantly the frightened, timid air of an overworked household slave. 
Bill, just as wilder, wilder, did not, however, lose his swaggering front. While men would cower and cringe before an upraised hand, Bill would growl and strike at it with his bill. It was very obvious who wore the trousers in that family. Their first separation on the opening day of the season, when Bill was hidden in the blind and Min was tethered out front, was heartrending. Min wanted to get back to that crate. No sooner did she realize that the comforting growl was now located in a clump of brush to which she could not swim, than she called upon whatever gods watch over ducks to witness the shamefulness, the helplessness, the loneliness of her plight. She paddled to the end of her tether, took a nervous drink, and raised her voice in such a quacking symphony that Joe Hollis, a mile away, heard it and sneaked in behind the big island to see what the devil was going on in the rice. The president of the ODHA suggested tentatively during her first sufferings that maybe we ought to tie Bill out there with her for a while to ease their parting and then bring him in again. If ever there was a picture of wifely bereavement, it was presented by men. But shortly, the plot thickened. It didn't take men more than 15 minutes to learn the folly of her widow's weeds. And the president and I witnessed then what might be termed by cynical people a typical act of fickle femininity. She ceased bawling and croaking for the lost mate. She ceased reaching for the rubber bracelet that held her. And she ruffled her feathers and cast her eye about for immediate assuagement of her grief. I rather think the playgirl in men came out at that moment. Maybe the bitter memory of a life of slavish subordination to Bill's whims rushed over her. The president said he thought that's what happened. He said any woman would have done the same thing if she'd lived with a guy like Bill. The eternal cunning of the female in need of companionship asserted itself when a flock of wary black ducks topped the big hill and wavered her way. Min paddled to the end of her tether and lifted up her voice in coyly worded invitations that doubtless gave promise of fine opportunities for hospitality and five o'clock tea. Afterward, the president declared she was telling the strangers the old man was home keeping house and she had the afternoon off. The blacks, interested but cautious, circled to set up once. To prove her friendliness, Min gabbled cozily, upended, and fed demonstratively. That was too much for the strangers. They came zooming in, and three learned a lesson in over-eagerness that was of no further use to them. To one of the slain blacks, the president, holding him admiringly at arm's length, spoke. And you are not the first man to meet disaster because of a lady's tongue. Hardly were we settled in the blind when a flock of green-winged teal, closely bunched, came squirting by. Men, taken aback at their sudden appearance out of nowhere, swung into action and called them back. She brought them to the very gates of hell, for they landed in the decoys. As we stood up, they leaped into the air in two little bunches. Five remained behind, thanks to men's help. Min was beginning to like her work. She called anything that flew. She called kingfishers the hussy. She called crows. She called two big blue herons that croaked about an impending doomsday as they came by. She called two flocks of yellowlegs. And she called a murderous marsh hawk, which for a moment made her wish she was off the street and back in the crate with Bill, growl and all. But the hawk was killed, and the yellowlegs stuck around and played in the shallows. And men went ahead like the Lorelei, luring good men to their death. Men's metamorphosis from a subdued, cringing housewife to a seductive hoory of the rice beds gave the president and me great hopes. The season had started auspiciously. Our favorite pond, nearly a half mile long, had shrunk to a mass of reeking lake bottom during the dry summer. Where five years ago, We'd rowed our boats in three feet of water, now bulged the ugly heads of muck bottom, with only here and there a stretch of water big enough to accommodate a flock of ducks. 
It was over one of these small remainders of a once famous duck rendezvous that we were shooting this year. If uh, men continued to deliver the goods, the early mallard and teal shooting problem was settled. Men certainly rose to the occasion in a big way. Single-handed on that opening day, she let loose her wiles on the summer-fed mallards and blacks. At sundown, the president and I had no complaint whatsoever to make of the bargain we'd made with the farmer. And this kind of shooting had been obtained where even with live decoys, it had not been easy to decoy mallards. Add to men's glory the fact that our blind that day was no work of hunter's art, but a five-foot contraption that jumped out of the flat sand like a farmer's silo. She was undoubtedly the best caller we had ever had. Her energy was amazing. Many callers are prone to quack a good deal when first set out, but lose their zest for the game and sit humped up on their stools, wishing someone had come along and take them in out of the wet. Min gave herself no rest. If a wing appeared in the distance, she went to work. And at 5 p.m. on that first warm day of the season, she was calling as valiantly as she had been when we put her to work four hours before. And so it went, from one shoot to the next. Always there was Min, out front, uttering the siren call of her kind, with Doer Bill hidden in the blind, growling at the whole performance. How many tense hours of peering and neck-twisting Min gave us cannot be calculated. We did no great amount of watching for ducks, when she was in the lobby collecting tickets. We sat and talked, and when she began to quack, in that anxious, penetrating voice, it was time enough to peer cautiously from the blind. The simple fascination of watching her, alternately preening herself and searching out tidbits, was often sufficient to keep interest alive in what might have been a dull half hour or so. As the season progressed, Min became more used to her work, but never did she cease to struggle and bite when we picked her out of the crate. The wild would not be lived down, no matter how much corn she got or how much gentle stroking. She accepted them, but that was all. She would be terrified at our close approach. But once tethered in front of the blind, her love of companionship quickly replaced whatever inferiority complex Bill had produced in her while she was with him. The crowning episode in Min's not-too-respectable career came on a white frost morning 20 minutes after we put her on the job. She had been strangely silent for about five minutes. Then I heard a familiar quacking about 300 yards away. I ran to the water's edge and found Min had broken away. A weak strand in the string that held her had given way, and Min was out there somewhere in the rice. Then the quacking grew stronger, coming our way. We saw through the dim morning light Min flying into the decoys. Her gait was slightly wabbly, but surprisingly strong for a bird that had not flown for months. She's repenting, whispered the president. Thought she'd leave Bill and the whole humdrum life, but decency wins. I sneaked out and got behind her. Finding herself cut off, she immediately leaped into the air and flew out of my sight. There was nothing domestic about the way she flung herself into the air. Before I knew what she was doing, she was 20 feet over my head and still climbing. And then she straightened out and departed. Well, you settled it for her, said the president. She thought she might tolerate Bill, but she won't stand for you. If that erring woman comes back, I'll buy you the best cigar in town. Now, if that were Bill, he'd stick around. He might run down to the pool hall for a little loafing, but he'd come back, not Min. If there's a Salvation Army Corps over in that rice bed, they can do a lot of good work right now for her. We heard Min's strident call resound over the marsh for five minutes, heard the answering quacking of other hens, and then all was quiet. Gosh, said I. I never dreamed she could fly that high. And she's probably flying higher right now than she ever did before, ventured the president. The morning passed and men cameth not back. We picked up the decoys, bundled Bill, growls and all, into the boat, 
and rode in for a noon lunch. By 3 p.m. we were back in the blind, ready for whatever action there might be. Although there had been quite a few mallards flying in the morning, we had decoyed none of them. How we missed men. As an added incentive for men's return, we staked Bill out 40 feet from the blind in plain view on the sand. Over there in the rice somewhere was Min, getting acquainted. We speculated whether or not she were strong enough to follow the flock southward. I thought not, although her ability to fly had amazed me when I'd tried to catch her on the beach that morning. The afternoon stretched into near sundown. The red ball of the sun was falling fast in the west behind the distant pines and maples. But no men. We got not a shot during the afternoon. Bill's growlings and meamphings had no effect whatsoever on the high-flying local ducks. It was hospitality of the fireside brand, which men offered that they were looking for. In one flock, flying low some distance away, I thought I detected men straggling along at the end of the procession, but could not be sure of it. The president was positive it wasn't men. If it had been she, he contended, she would have brought every one of those ducks right in to us. We were about to pick up the outfit and set out for home when the president crouched lower and cried, Mark, single on the left. I could not make out the incomer at first and saw the president adjusting himself for a quick rise and a shot over the blind. And just as he stood up, I got a good look at the duck, flying strongly, but with legs dangling. Those legs looked tired, and there was a familiar air about the duck. I shouted to Mr. President to wait, and he lowered his gun. And in flew men, as big as life. The tired old lady flopped into the very spot where her tether had held her that morning. We watched. Bill growled. What a tongue lashing she's going to get, whispered Mr. President. She seems glad to be back. Bill's a fool if he takes her back, offered the president. But she's here. She wants to stay. Min cautiously waddled ashore. Her spirits drooped, and she didn't seem to be so sure about walking up to where Bill was tethered. I got up and staked Bill farther away from the blind. She swam about in the decoys while I completed the job. Then she slowly approached Bill once more. He was far enough away from the blind so that our presence in it could not have frightened her much. But still she was doubtful. Quack, quack, she said, by way of peace offering. me amph, me amph, answered Bill. For some minutes they kept up a desultory conversation. She's telling him, where she's been and what she's been doing, I whispered to the president. Like hell she is, he retorted. She's telling him what a swell guy he is. What she's been doing isn't repeated even in duck circles. She sure wants to come back home and be forgiven. Bill's a sap, pronounced the president. For all his growling, he's just another weak-kneed husband. Now, 20 years ago, a wife caught in such a predicament was thankful if all she got was a black eye. The rising generation has changed all that. He'll take her back to his bed and board again and like it. And unless we get a new tether string for men, she'll be looking forward all week long to these weekends. Once a woman starts that way, there's no stopping her. The president and I watched the reconciliation for about 15 minutes. By degrees, Min found her way to the side of her surly spouse. Everything was all right with Bill, it seemed. He was glad to see her. His vibrant me were contentment in themselves. Min remained very close by his side. This seemed to flatter him. After a while, Mr. President and I swooped down on her. She surrendered with surprising quickness, a few feints at the water, then a quick retreat to the jack pine cover, where she could not move rapidly. And she was back in her old role as Bill's wife, safe in the box with him. From that time on, we saw to it that Min was securely tethered. Her overtures were nonetheless vociferous and productive of ducks. 
And doubtless she carried the memory of her one fling. But she's had her day. After that, she behaved herself. And despite her one flagrant divergence from the straight and narrow, Mr. President and I shall always think of her as a friend who took pride in her work and brought in the ducks. Queer how the wildness stays in them after five generations in a farmyard, I remarked to the President on the way home the day of Min's adventure. It's hard to believe she could recognize her own kind in those strange mallards. Strangers! exclaimed the president. That may have been once, but not any longer. Not any longer. In the presence of mine enemies. The dusk of late duck season was hurrying westward across the sky, and slanting snow was whitening the street gutters, as I turned into the automotive emporium of the president of the Old Duck Hunters Association. The man in the parts department explained that his honor was out on the used car lot. There I found him, thoughtfully kicking a tire on an august and monstrous second-hand car, soon to be taking the association on its final expedition of the season. We could try Libby Bay again, he reflected, but hole in the wall will be frozen. Ken says every blue bill on Dig Devils has hauled his freight. Shallow bay'd be open at the Narrows, and I suppose Joe's hauled in all his boats. Phoned Hank. He said there's an inch of ice on Mud Lake, and she's making fast. He went over the possibilities. The situation was urgent, for only a few days remained of the season. The widespread, below the Copper Dam on the St. Croix, might not see a thing except sawbells. The grassy island in the open water of the St. Louis River. Too much big water to buck in this wind. Taylor's Point on the Big Eau Claire. <laughs> Wind's wrong for it. And she's going to stay in that quarter. Streetlights came on. And home-going city toilers bent into the growing storm with collars turned up. One of them crossed the street and tried the showroom door, which the parts man had just locked. Mr. President called from the lot. Something I can do for you? You darn tootin', came the reply. Open up this dump. Let a man get warm, Mr. President grinned. It's Chad, he said, making haste to unlock the showroom door. Anyone in that community on reasonable terms with the way of the duck, the trout, the partridge, and the white-tailed deer knows Chad just as he knows Mr. President. Before the days when I cut myself in as an apprentice, the ODHA had consisted almost solely of Mr. President and Chad. In recent years, they get together only a couple of times per year on outdoor missions, which can be anything from looking up old trout holes to picking blueberries. But they meet regularly in church, except during the duck season, and possibly two or three Sundays in late May or early June, when the shad flies hatch. Chad is an especially stout pillar of the church, and passes the collection plate with a stern and challenging eye on the brethren he considers too thrifty. The belligerent affection which his honor and Chad reciprocate was once amply demonstrated at a men's club meeting in the church basement, when suggestions were called for. Get a one-armed guy to take Chad's job passing the plate, volunteered Mr. President. Chad, who came upon holiness late in life and became so enchanted with biblical wisdom that he quotes verses every chance, snorted back, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. The time, Chad announced, is short. Well, there'll be no 14-year-old touring car with California top repaired here this night, declared Mr. President. Tell you what, though, bring it down to the lot and I'll give you $7.50 for it on a new job. My son, attend unto my wisdom, said Chad sagely. Last deer season I was on a drive in back of Little Bass Lake. Found a spring hole at the edge of a big marsh. His eyes gleamed with what is recognized in church as religious fervor. No map shows it. Everything else in the country was froze up 
and this little spring hole was open. Now there's a point of high, dry land poking into it. There's smart weed in there and watercress, and the day I saw it, mallards jumped out of it. How about the road in? We'll have to walk a mile. Mr. President frowned briefly, but Chad's mustache became a reasonably straight line as he intoned, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Now, Rodden, let's at it then, decided Mr. President. Quick getaways are no problem for the ODHA in the critical times of the season. At such times, decoys are always sorted and sacked, shell boxes full, and thermos bottles yawning for their soup and coffee. Against emergency conditions, Mr. President also sets the old horse blanket and barn lantern conveniently at hand in the garage for it's by these implements that he keeps warm in late season blinds. A mere accessory to their reunion, I drove the big car while the two cronies smoked and remembered. They agreed I'd come in handy toting gear and that I could be put to use if ice had to be broken. Objections on my part were swept away as Chad patted me on the back and said piously, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. Fine, slanting snow darted across the path of the headlights. With that northwest wind, I knew it would not snow much. But should the wind veer to the northeast, then we'd be very happy at having the heavy, high-wheeled monster of a car for bucking drifts. It was a little after 9 p.m. when we disembarked beneath the high oaks which spread over Norm's place on the north shore of Big Yellow Lake, Burnett County, Wisconsin. Norm appeared with a flashlight. Might have known it'd be no one but you out on a night like this. He lit an airtight stove in an overnight cabin. Chad, police suspenders drooping as he readied for bed, set his old alarm clock with the bell on top for 5 a.m. A few minutes were allowed for final smokes and for further recollection of past delights. Chad had started to recall the night we slept on the depot floor at Winnebago when a car entered the yard. Again, Norm emerged, prepared a cabin, and went back to sleep. As is always the way in duck camps, the newcomers pounded on our door for a pre-dawn investigation. As the two men entered, somewhat suspiciously, I thought, Chad's face fell for a brief instant. But he made a quick recovery and fell upon the two hunters with vast friendship. Where were they going to hunt in the morning? Weren't we all crazy for being out in such weather? How's the missus and the children? Chad volunteered with barefaced frankness that we were going down the Yellow River a piece to that widespread just this side of Eastman's. Our visitors alleged uh, they had it in mind to try the deep point in the cane grass across the Big Yellow. Mr. President and Chad solemnly agreed that sounded like a promising spot, mighty promising. The two departed for bed, and Chad cried after them cheerfully, See you in church, boys. The moment they were gone, Chad seized his alarm clock and set it to ring an hour earlier. Those fakers aren't fooling me, he snorted. Me either, said Mr. President. Somebody knows something. Yeah, they were with me on that deer drive last fall. Gentlemen, say your prayers well tonight. There's only one spot on that marsh that's really any good, and that's the little spring hole. He rolled in with a final muttering, deliver me from the workers of iniquity. And within a few minutes, the cabin resounded with the devout snores of Mr. President and Chad. I lay awake a bit longer, listening to the wind in the oaks, weighing our chances for the morrow and marveling at the hypocritical poise of my comrades in the face of emergency. I knew those two adversaries of ours better than well. One was a piano tuner who by some transference of vocational talent could play a tune on a Model 97 that was strictly lethal so far as ducks are concerned. The other was a butcher likewise noted for his wing shooting and his stoutness in going anywhere after ducks. Mr. President and Chad snored. The snow tapped on the window like fine sand. And then suddenly someone was shaking me in the dark. It was Mr. President. Get up quietly, he hissed. 
we beat the alarm clock so they wouldn't hear it. Don't turn on the light. Don't even strike a match. Like burglars, we groped in the dark getting dressed and gathering up gear. How about breakfast, I asked. Mr. President snickered. Chad's voice came as from a sepulcher in the pitch dark. Trust in the Lord and do good. Softly, we closed the door behind us and climbed into the car. Mr. President got behind the wheel with Chad beside him and me alone in the back seat. The motor roared, headlights blazed, and almost simultaneously a light went on in the cabin of our neighbors. Step on her, Chad shouted, and the old crate made the snow fly as it leaped out of Norm's yard. We got the jump on them, Chad exulted, but did not forget to add, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell forever. It was a wild ride on a wild morning. The snow had stopped when two to three inches lay on the level. That was enough to make for skidding turns on the sharp corners where Mr. President kept to maximum speed. We roared up steep hills and kept the power on going down. We passed white barns, ghostly and cold-looking in the dark. And at a field fronting a farmstead owned by one honorary member of the ODHA, Gus Blomberg, Chad ordered the car halted. He got out took something from Gus's front yard that rattled like tin and stuffed it into the car trunk. What was it, Chad, I asked. Out of the mouths of babes and fools, he retaliated, poked Mr. President in the ribs and roared, Step on her some more. He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. I knew part of the road, but after they skirted the base of the long point jutting into Little Bass Lake and took to pulp trails through the Jack Pine Barrens, I was lost. Chad ordered right or left or sometimes don't forget to turn out for that big scrub oak. We labored up a hilltop on a barely discernible pair of ruts and the big car came to a stop, practically buried in low scrub oak. Instantly the lights were switched off and Mr. President and Chad listened for sound of the enemy's motor. They heard nothing, but nevertheless hurried with the job of loading up with the sinews of war and heading for the spring hole. Only you who have been there know how a 60-pound sack of decoys in a Duluth pack sack can cut into the shoulders when hands are occupied with gun and shell box. Chad led the way in the dark and took us miraculously through the better parts of that oak and pine tangle. A half mile along the way we stopped to listen again. And this time we heard the motor of another car laboring up the hill through the scrub. Step on her again, counseled Chad, shouldering his burdens. They haven't forgotten the way in, and that piano tuner can run like a deer. Chad permitted the use of lights now. We stumbled for what seemed miles, until he led us down a gentle slope. And there before us was black open water, about an acre of it. The omens were good. Mallards took off as a flashlight slit across the water. Keep the dang lights on all you want, said Mr. President. Let them know we're here fustest with the mostest. Mr. President and I spread his ancient decoys while Chad busied himself on a mysterious errand some distance away. As I uncoiled decoy strings, I saw that the hole was a mere open dot in what must have been a large, flat marsh. Tall flaggers hemmed in the open water and stretched far beyond the range of the flashlight. Mr. President and I dug a pit in soft sand on fairly high ground and embroidered the edges of it with jack pine and scrub oak. We heard the piano tuner and the butcher push through the cover on the hill at our back, heard them panting and talking in low voices. Chad returned and boomed for all to hear, ain't a thing open but this one little patch. Betcha we don't see a feather here today. He fooled no one. The piano tuner and the butcher made a wide circle around us. We could hear him crashing through brush, and Chad grudgingly allowed that butcher can hit that bush like a bull moose. And then we heard them walking across the marsh ice among the raspy flaggers. And soon, 500 yards across the marsh from us came the sound of chopping as they ready to blind. Chad was worried. No open water there, but that's the place where the mallards come in here from the St. Croix River. Those muzzlers are right in front of a low pass through the hills. Them mallards come through there like you opened a door for them. There was at least an hour's wait to shooting time. 
the two old hands puttered with the blind. They rigged crotched sticks to keep their shotgun breeches away from the dribbling sand of the blind's wall. They made comfortable seats for themselves. And finally, as was their right by seniority, they wrapped the old horse blanket about their knees with the lantern beneath and toasted their shins in stinking comfort. Long before there was any real light, ducks returned to our open water and the ODHA, waiting nervously, sipped coffee and made a career out of not clinking the aluminum cups. In that blind with Mr. President, it was almost worth a man's life to kick a shell box accidentally in the dark. Chad briefed us. When the time comes, don't nobody miss on them first ones. Because our friends over there are situated to scare out incomers. That is, in case they get a shot. Praise be, neither one of them are cloudbusters. As the zero hour approached, Mr. President produced his gold watch and chain. And the two of them followed the snail's pace of the minute hand. Chad said, good idea not to jump the gun. No use to break the law. To which Mr. President added, might be a game warden hanging around too. Now, as Mr. President gave the word, Chad kicked his shell box and stood up. The air was full of flailing wings. I missed one, got it with a second barrel, and heard three calculated shots from Mr. President's automatic. I also heard Chad's cussing. He had forgotten to load his corn sheller. The air was a bright cerulean blue until his city conscience smote him and he said remorsefully, wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. With daylight, the wind shifted from northwest to northeast and the snow began again from Lake Superior this time. That kind of snow at that season is not to be trifled with for nor'easters can blow for three days and fetch mighty drifts. I picked up the Drake Mallard I had downed and the three birds Mr. President had collected in his methodical way. The two old hands agreed that none of the mallards were locals, but reg legs down from Canada. Feel the heft of that one. There was a long wait after that first burst of shooting. Obviously, there were not many ducks left in the country. The original ODHA comforted themselves with hot coffee and thick sandwiches. From time to time, one of them ascended the little knob at our rear to look across the snowy marsh and observe operations over there. Chad came back from a reconnaissance and exclaimed, she's working, glory be. The words were hardly out of his mouth when five mallard materialized out of the smother, circled the open water, and cupped wings to drop in. As they zoomed in, Mr. President and Chad picked off a drake apiece, and when the wind had blown them to the edge of the ice, I picked him up. You got him. Broke pretty well, Chad observed. Fair, just fair, grunted Mr. President, squinting through the snow. He's steady to wing and shot, but a mite nervous on incomers. Needs more field work. Shortly before noon, I climbed the hill myself for a look across the marsh. Through the snow, over the high flaggers, I could make out the dark green blob that was the jack pine blind of the butcher and piano tuner. We'd not heard a shot from that place. As I watched, six mallards, mere specks at first, approached the marsh from the direction of the St. Croix River. They were coming through the low hill pass, just as Chad had said they would. Normally, they would have flown almost directly over the distant blind. Some distance from the blind, I saw them flare and climb, then swing wide around the edge of the marsh and sail straight into our open hole. From my vantage point, I saw the two old hands rise and fire, and three ducks fell. Mr. President called up to me, Pick up that one that dropped in the scrub, will you? We'd better keep careful count, Chad suggested. In a few minutes, he dropped two more that tried to sneak into the water hole. I'm through, he announced. He acknowledged his limit with a thankful verse. Thou hast turned for me my morning into dancing. The afternoon moved along. The snow increased, and when limits were had all around, we finished the last of the soup, washed it down with the now lukewarm coffee, and picked up. It was high time we were moving. A good six inches of snow was on the ground. There were steep, slippery hills between us and the main road. Back at the car, 
We turned the behemoth around. Parked just to the rear of us was the conveyance of the piano tuner and the butcher. It was a modern job, with the low-slung build of a dachshund. But in maneuvering out of the place, Mr. President's locomotive-like contraption broke out a good trail. Mr. President and Chad were jubilant as the big car was tooled carefully over the crooked road to Norm's, where we picked up gear left behind in the unlighted cabin hours before and said goodbye to Norm. Until the smallmouth take a notion to hit in the St. Croix, homeward bound, Chad's best Sunday basso profundo broke into a sincere rendition of an old hymn which emphasized that he will carry you through. And Mr. President joined him with a happy off-key baritone. We halted at the curb in front of Chad's house, and he emerged from the car laden with mallards and gear and smelling of horse blanket and kerosene. We sure fooled him, said Mr. President. Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies, Chad intoned, and went up his walk to the door. At Mr. President's back door, I helped him with the unloading. What I demanded was the thing Chad had removed from Gus Blomberg's front yard. Well, sir, said Mr. President, it was a device calculated to do the undoable and solve the unsolvable. I couldn't have done better myself. He sat down on a shell box on his back steps, the better to laugh at his partner's cunning. You know, he said, when he stuck that thing out there, just in the right place, he came back to the blind and he told me, mine enemies are lively and they are strong. W w but what was it? I insisted. All I know is there was something out there that made those mallards flare. His honor picked up the shell box, his hand on the doorknob, and said, it was Gus Blomberg's scarecrow. I'm surprised you haven't figured it out. Well, all I could guess was that it was something made of tin cans. I heard him rattle. <laughs> Gus Blomberg, said Mr. President, always drapes tin cans on his scarecrows so they'll rattle in the wind. <laughs> Good night to you, sir. And don't forget to come over tomorrow night and help me pick these ducks. Bab of the Brule. Let us stop and wrap this four-pound rainbow around George's neck, said the president of the old Duck Hunters Association with a chuckle. We were returning from a trout opening on Wisconsin's fabulous and fickle Brule. It was dark and cold. Only the hardiest of the spring peepers sang. The northern lights whirled fluorescent banners. The old man got the idea of showing George his big fish while he changed socks in the back seat of the car. I'm going to show him this fish. Your Honor, said I, Bab will have at least two like it, and his wife will have fifteen, none under a foot. A wet and sandy wader sock swished alongside my ear. So you won't stop? Very soon we were ascending the front steps of George A. Bab's house. It's late, darn near 10.30, I whispered. Knock, commanded his Honor both hands around that slab-sided rainbow. Mrs. Babb opened the door. Where's George? George! Her call went up the stairway. A sleepy, who is it, came down the stairs. It's Al, she explained. He's got a fish he wants to show you. Yeah, t tell him, said Mr. President, that I want to show him the kind he never catches. Her voice went dutifully up the stairs again. He's come to show you up, George, dear. The bare feet of George A. Babb hit the floor above. Down he came in his nightshirt, tousled and sleepy, but belligerent. There were no formalities between Babb of the Brule and the peerless leader of the old duck hunters. George said, produce your minnow. The rainbow was slid beneath his nose. George took one contemptuous look and headed for the kitchen. He promised en route that presently he would unveil an opening day catch fit to take home. He suggested to Mrs. Babb that it was a good time to put on the coffee pot. And he dragged into the living room, right across the rugs, as mighty an assortment of square-tailed cold water fish as this scribe has seen in many a year. They were in a wash tub, iced, about two dozen. A few were under a pound. The center of interest 
was a huge, deep-bellied monster of a rainbow. Gargantua, cried Bab, holding it up alongside Mr. President's four-pounder. Holy man, said the President. It'll go a good five pounds. Six and a half, Bab snorted. Hmm. I guess, said the old man, that I just took in too much territory. Like the man who wrestled the bear, said George. You're already yelling, stop or I'll let go. There was vast talk thereafter. George told how he had done it. Salmon eggs and worms with a Colorado spinner early in the day. Then big wet flies at midday and back to bait when the sun rolled under the hill. Mr. President managed to issue a few remarks about his own trophy, taken on a black bucktail just below May's rips. It was a fine meeting until his honor's natural tendencies took charge. Tell you what I'll do, George. I'll lay you my rod, the one with the 12-inch cork grip, to your waiters. The next opening night, I'll appear on these premises with a bigger rainbow than anything you'll have in that tub. The hoots of George A. Babb followed us down the steps. George Babb was perhaps the most proficient fisherman ever to wet a line in the Douglas County Brule. He is the only trout fisherman I know who once announced he would take trout from a certain place at a certain time and did it in the presence of a gallery of picnickers. He came early to the Brule country from Maine. There's a Babs Island in the Penobscot River of Maine and one in Wisconsin's Flambeau River, both named for logging day kin of George's. He followed the woods, then took up barbering, fishing, and guiding. Although Bab had all the bristly characteristics of a mad porcupine, he had a tender streak in him from here to there. I saw him quit fishing one good evening when accidentally with a push pole, he knocked a cedar waxwing nest from a tree, drowning the fledglings while trying to retrieve a hung fly. He knew the game from A to Z. He loved to disagree with the experts. He had a voice that could boom out a half mile across the Brule's big lake. His whisper was a buzz saw. I am pretty sure that once for a year or so, he held the world's record for a brown trout, a fish of some 16 pounds, taken about 1916. When a president of the United States came for three months to the Brule, it was Bab who was called on to teach him fly fishing. This then was Bab, a man who could wrestle you for a dollar and a half any day and give you his last chew of tobacco. Homeward bound, I reminded Mr. President that he was about to lose his pet rod. Soothed by Mrs. Babb's coffee and unruffled about the future, he said, if there's a fishing season next year, I'll win. Nuts, said I. Wake me up, said he, when we hit the edge of town. I want to get all my gear in one place so you won't drive off with it. In the long interim of winter, I heard reports of meetings of these two. George would come to town once every so often, and stop at Mr. President's place of business, mostly to promise his honor that he would have that fly rod come May 1st. I heard reports of the two of them locked in mortal combat over fishing tactics, though the thermometer stood at 10 below. One observer relayed that on a street corner where they met one evening, he heard Bab exclaim contemptuously, that old nine-foot crowbar of yours ain't got but the one tip, and that's took a set. To which our peerless leader replied, Your own wife told me you bought those waiters the year Taft was elected. On opening day, I found myself at 4.30 a.m. driving again to the Brule. The old man sized up the look of the country as we drove. He said he liked darn near everything that morning. He liked the way the popples were fuzzy when the car lights touched them. He liked the way the season had come belatedly so that the big migratory rainbows from Lake Superior would still be in the river. He also liked the way the spring peepers were hollering, like they had a cheerleader. Mm, but, he continued, I do not like George A. Babb this morning. You're not running out on that bet. Me? 
I'm just mad at him this morning because I'm sure his darn old waiters leak. Ere this day is out, his hide will be tacked on the barn door. I had doubts. Had the field of honor been any of a dozen other North Wisconsin streams, I'd have felt safer about Mr. President's rod. Bab knew that brule like the mink that live along its banks. And there was another reason for concern on my part. Mr. President, not at all like himself, didn't know exactly where he wanted to put into the stream. It was not time for confusion. The omens were bad. In Fettel, the old man would have gone to his chosen place as the bee goes to the honey tree. He speculated as we drove along. I'd hit for the Cloquet Bridge. Only it might rain. We'd get stuck on those hills. Meadows north of Brule might be all right. But there'll be too many there. Winnebajou's a good starter. But since they tore out the South Shore trestle, I don't like the look of it. It was breaking day. A decision was in order. No inspired directions came from Mr. President. So I nudged his ancient car beyond Winnebajou and down a two-rut road. It's a good place if you get to the end of it with auto springs intact. He took a long time to get into his waders. He dallied over his gear. He let the leader and line slip back through the guide several times before he had it threaded properly. He asserted that the canned salmon eggs you get nowadays are no good. He exhibited all the insecurity of a lamb getting fat in a feeding pen and not liking it a little bit. It was light when we hit the river. I suppose, said Mr. President, that by this time his wife has caught all the trout he needs. Who needs George A. Babb, you darn fool? He left me there, preoccupied and I think skeptical of this day's luck. I hardly knew whether to laugh or suggest extenuating circumstances, such as um, substituting another rod for the nonpareil nine-footer. I knew as Mr. President vanished downstream that up the river some distance the wizard, Bab, was working a magic line over excellent trout water. True, Mr. President might hang a hook in the mouth of a monster, and George might meet up with a bad day. It was unlikely, though. The only warm praise I can speak for that cold morning is that there were no mosquitoes. Back from the riverbank in the little hollows, there was crisp ice. My wader boots crunched through plenty of it as I went upstream along the bank. The river does a good bit of twisting here. In a few places, it has tried to cut cross lots. These are hard to get around, harder to wade through. The business of lifting first one foot and then the other from these mucky bottomed backwaters served to warm me up. I came to a place where the stream is wadeable down its center with a deep, long groove of water under the left bank. Willows tip over it. Perhaps there was something in there. The routine was followed in the strict early season tradition for these waters. Worms and salmon eggs with spinners and without. Then big gaudy flies. Then those black bucktails. After four hours, all I had was an empty tobacco can which had housed some splendid worms. The river seemed dead. I grew tired of a fruitless campaign beneath the willows, went ashore, lit a fire, and stretched. The sun climbed, the grass beneath me warmed up, I dozed a bit. And then I was suddenly awake, wide awake, for a man was standing over me, tickling my nose with the slightly dried tail of a six-pound rainbow trout. The man was the president of the old duck hunters. I got him, he exulted. His waders are practically hanging in my garage this minute. That big one he had last spring was a fluke. And he related that he had found a hole and stuck with it. He saw the big one roll and worked on him for two hours. Threw a hardware store at him. Finally, I dug around and brought up this little wooden wobbler. Bet I showed it to him 200 times before he took it. And when he took it, <laughs> then I says, as I, George, if those waiters leak, you'll have to pay for the vulcanizing. Mr. President was indeed jubilant. The contrast with his mood of early morning was impressive. He said he felt so darn good that he'd climb the steep hill to the car and bring down a frying pan so I can fry up the little ones you got. 
I explained I did not have even one little one, that we did not have a frying pan in the car, and that he was just trying to rub it in. Ah, he said, got you both licked. And then he rolled over and fell asleep in the sun. While he sought that repose to which he was entitled, I tried again along this favorite water of mine. The warmer weather helped. Wet flies attracted interest. I nailed a few. Half a hatful, Mr. President said later. Ain't you ever going to catch a fish too big for a creel? In the evening, we went up the hill out of the steep valley. He sat on the running board, and I pulled off his waders, a ceremony which concludes with the puller being shoved sprawling by the pulley. He permitted me to take down his rod. And don't leave any ragtag bobtail a leader one run the reel. I cramped the car wheels to get it out of the narrow turnaround, and we started down the two-rut road. Mr. President leaned back with a taste of victory in his mouth and chortled, Wait till you see Bab's face fall. All the way, the old man was drinking hot blood right out of the neck. Ho, oh, ho, he said generously. Bab isn't such a bad fisherman. He'll have some fair fish under the kitchen sink in that ding-danged wash tub. He'll be in bed when we get there, pretending he's asleep and hoping we won't have the heart to bother him. Can't you push this old hack a bit faster? He lifted up his voice in snatches of song. One ballad dealt with how tall the chickens grew in Cheyenne. He also gave a sincere rendition of the Stars and Stripes Forever. But it seemed to me he put his whole best into the march of the Cameron men. Going up the Bab front steps, he was toting that dangling rainbow and humming she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. Bab himself opened the door. Mr. President got right down to the bricks immediately. Bring on your fish, he demanded. Bab grinned. You knew when you saw his grin that it was an emblem of defeat. He slapped the old man on the back and roared, You got me this time, cold turkey. I never saw a sign of a fish half that big. Bring on the waiters, demanded Mr. President. Put on the coffee, said George. There was vast talk thereafter. George told how he had done it, salmon eggs and worms with a Colorado spinner early in the day, then big wet flies at midday, and back to bait when the sun rolled under the hill. Mr. President managed to issue a few remarks about his own trophy. The pair of them, well along, gray and grizzled, did a lot of remembering. They went over the history of the Brule from the 90s and the history of Lake Nebagaman from the days when the Weyerhausers had their headquarters there. It was late when we left. Bab brought out the waders, still very damp. Looks to me like the darn things leak, Mr. President sniffed. <laughs> I'll say they do. I gave him a month's wear just today. Well, said Mr. President in a burst of magnanimity, what do I want with leaky waders? I just wanted to show you, dang you. That you did, Bab admitted. Mr. President went out the door toward the car. I remained behind, for Bab had plucked my coat sleeve. He whisked me quickly to the kitchen. There was the familiar wash tub iced. On top of a welter of trout lay a rainbow. Such a trout as men dream of. Huge. Glistening carmen and olive. It's nice of you, George, I said, before hurrying out to the car. You know, he's getting old. Sure, sure, he said. I am too.